is, for example, further in terms of breathing, in terms of other physiological conditions. So as I mentioned, um, this is really uh, an interdisciplinary area. So, uh, we see the research contributions from a number of technical communities, from uh, visual processing, computer vision, to biomedical engineering uh, researchers looking at what are the mechanisms uh, of the biomedical in, in terms of the physiology, um, and then uh, what are the underlying physical properties that we can utilize. The digital processing help us to cope with these very small noisy signals. And certainly uh, in our information forensic and security community, we commonly deal with a very small signal. There are also a number of security um, um, and privacy issues. So here um, I used this uh, slide and we are going to uh, repeatedly showing you, but highlight a different part to look at a, a range of uh, research issues. Uh, um, for example, there are the sensing mechanism. We, uh, as I mentioned, we are going to focus on this uh, cardiovascular measurement in, the in terms of the heartbeat signal um, and using the um, camera or generally optical sensing uh, known as a PPG signal, which I'm going to talk about uh, more in a minute. And uh, um, how do we, what are the underlying mechanism? How do we extract them uh, from video and uh, um, what kind of mechanism we use, such as the principled signal processing approaches that are explainable, or uh, we have more data so we can learn that uh, with the deep learning um, and other machine learning uh, mechanisms uh, that has uh, been becoming very popular in recent years. And from those heartbeat, uh, in, in addition to heart rate, if we can analyze the cycle by cycle, we can analyze the uh, variabilities between the cycles and also how does that optical means relate to the more uh, known in the medical field when we go to um, do um, a house uh, check, uh, we have this ECG um, uh, electrocardiogram and that is actually measuring the, uh, the muscle contractions, those uh, actual potentials uh, of our heart muscles functions. So what are the relations of them? Can we infer from the PPG uh, to the ECG and why that could be important. And toward the end, we were going to talk about how do we infer some of the physical uh, conditions from Wi-Fi signal. And there are also roles of uh, what the signal processing performs, uh, what visions uh, would take, and what are the various learning techniques. And we will talk about some of the shared mechanisms we see not only with the physiological forensics, but actually could also apply to other forensics. In fact, some of our, our techniques was inspired by the work we work on other type of media forensics and then motivated us to apply to the physiological uh, problems and that bring us to this uh, uh, area in the first place. There are various considerations of privacy issues and uh, certainly I mentioned about the synergy with other forensics. Uh, and then in the second part, we are going to talk about some of the tiny application, both for the um, health monitoring, particularly in the pandemics uh, and related uh, to other forensic and security issues. So as I promised, uh, um, I want to first explain to you this uh, term that you may often see in the physiological uh, literature, especially in this area called a PPG. Um, so the PPG uh, is a, a, a short name uh, of a longer word, it's a compound word, photohistogram. So photo basically means optical sensing. So this could be I mean, with video, but uh, um, more classically uh, to measure the heart conditions, we have been um, using this uh, uh, fingertip pulse oximeters uh, uh, which would use the photo diet to measure um, some of these uh, um, light uh, strings that, that could be periodically changing um, um, during this mechanism. And the PLC uh, means uh, measuring an instrument, measuring volume changes. In this case, we are measuring the blood volume changes as the blood um, flow periodically uh, to the extremities, like the different parts of our body. And the gram is basically visualized them. So that's the PPG. Um, so here is a, a cross section of our skin. Um, and you can see that when we have a light penetrating uh, into our skin, there's a different layers of our skin. There's this 
uh, surface layers, and then there start to be layers with this uh, capillary of the blood vessels. Uh, there are those uh, with uh, more oxygen-rich uh, artery uh, vessels, as well as those veins. And it's interesting that the biomedical literature, uh, researchers have studied what will be the effect uh, when we uh, shine lights and then measuring the uh, lights, especially at the um, our kind of fingertip, our skin is relatively thin, and then we can shine lights on one side and then measure what would be the light penetrated uh, uh, and in terms of the strength changes. So it turned out that uh, uh, the, the light actually, um, uh, when we measure it, there's a, a, a kind of stable part forming kind of DC or very, very slowly changing. Those are contributed by um, the, the tissues absorbing some of the light and the panic and the letting uh, some of them through. And then those, the, ven the vein, the venous blood, um, doesn't really pulsate uh, according to the, to the uh, blood rate uh, um, as much. And then the most of the saturating part coming from the artery blood. But there's also kind of a, a more stable part and then the part that we would see a uh, pulsatal component that uh, really periodical changing at the pace of our heartbeat. So when we um, um, measure what would be the, the, the amount of light after penetrations, we can see that the part that being absorbed more, we will measure a less amount, and the part that being absorbed less, we will measure a higher amount. So you will see this periodical, what we know as the PPG waveform that has uh, both a steady part and uh, a, a kind of a changing part, or uh, in our single processing terminology, we see a slowly changing DC and low frequency component, and then a periodical part uh, forming the AC. Uh, so when we measure the PPG, depending on the type of uh, sensing mechanisms, we are going to illustrate conceptually where the light source and where are the photodetectors. So a typical setup is using this uh, uh, pulse oximeters, as in this picture. We have a light source on one side, and then we have a photodetector on the other side. Um, so this is uh, the contact-based uh, kind of transmission penetration model. Uh, using the, um, uh, the the fitness watch or uh, or Fitbit type of a fitness uh, uh, bracelet, uh, we are going to see the light is actually in the same side uh, with the detector. So this is the uh, contact-based uh, reflection model. So both are contact-based. Now, uh, with the video, we are looking at a light source and then shining light there or from the ambient uh, lighting condition. And then um, the, the light could be reflected from different layers um, and could also penetrate further and then reflect it back uh, using the photo sensors of um, our uh, camera. So this would be a contactless reflection. So this would have uh, um, different implications in terms of whether the light source is under our control. In the uh, finger paper oximeter cases, especially not only to measure the uh, heartbeat, uh, um, but also to, um, um, to measure the blood oxygen levels. Um, scientists in the um, in, um, biomedical field have found that using a different wavelengths, for example, using the infrared as well as a red uh, um, uh, wavelengths, uh, using different uh, um, um, light sources, uh, we will see different uh, um, uh, absorption properties. And then by analyzing the differences over different wavelengths, we will be able to derive black oxygen levels. Now, in this case, uh, in the um, contact reflection cases, uh, the device manufacturer can also have some control of the, the light sources. Uh, in the video situations, however, depending on the setup, like if we don't want the person to know we are doing and also uh, subject to the, um, the health and safety uh, issues, we will be seeing potentially much uncontrolled light sources. So that will be more challenging conditions. Okay, so uh, because of the optical nature of the sensing, uh, we are naturally really subject to various uh, physical uh, limitations. 
Um, and naturally, you may think about, well, what would be the um, impact from different type of skin or different skin colors? And indeed, uh, this is an area uh, where we uh, have seen um, um, different uh, um, uh, effect uh, because uh, fundamentally, the darker skins uh, would absorb more of the uh, light and reflect less. So generally, in terms of the signal processing context, we are dealing with uh, different uh, signal to ratio as a general effect uh, from different uh, um, skin color. But certainly, depending on what physiological conditions uh, we are measuring, the impact could be different. Uh, so generally, when we uh, perform data collections, it is desirable to have as balanced representations in the human subject studies as possible to capture different uh, skin uh, color group. A typical characterization is according to the um, uh, this uh, uh, Fitzpatrick skin prototype that assess the skin's reactions to the uh, exposure of sunlight. Um, so uh, as I briefly mentioned, uh, with the ECG that measures the electrical potential of the heart muscles, it will have this typical uh, signal waveforms uh, known as the QRS complex, but there's also uh, a, a P part that uh, pre the uh, contractions and the T part um, as the, the blood uh, is being released to different part of the body. Um, and in contrast uh, with the optical sensing, we are sensing the blood volume changes at the end part of our body or extremities. Um, and we see after the, the blood uh, um, um, going through different part of body, um, it, in self of these uh, very sharp waveforms of the ECG, we observe a much smoother uh, waveforms in the PPG sensing. So we will uh, revisit this uh, uh, in the second part uh, of the, the talk, but I want to uh, uh, first uh, kind of setting up the stage uh, the, uh, from different uh, measuring modalities, we see different uh, waveform shapes. Uh, so now I'm, I'm going to pass uh, the baton um, to Chao Wei, uh, and he's going to introduce uh, the, uh, the uh, how we uh, extract the uh, PPG uh, from the uh, optical modalities uh, and uh, what are the different mechanisms, Chao Wei. And, and actually, while we are transitioning, if there is any uh, quick questions uh, and the clarifying uh, questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Ming, for setting up the stage. So let's see if we have any questions from the audience now. Uh, if no, I will get started. Okay, so I'm going to talk about more uh, technical uh, detail about the sensing mechanisms. Uh, so we are go going to look at the RPPG, remote PPG signal sense and sensing, uh, either through the principal signal processing-based approaches or more modern deep learning-based approaches. So this is a typical um, sensing pipeline of a principle-based approach. Uh, we can have a video of the human skin, like the face or like the hands, and then we will send it into a skin detector operator, like the face detection algorithm can and locate where the face is. Uh, if we want more precision, we can do some landmark de detection to determine which area on the face is exactly of interest. And then because we're using a RGB camera, we are going to do a um, color channel combination using certain RPPG extraction algorithm, which will be the main focus of this subsection. So once we combine the three time series of RGB signals into one time series, it will be kind of noisy as you see here, but you can already see there is certain periodicity inside it. And then because we're looking at the PPG signal, which is due to the heartbeat, so it is periodic. And we know that the average heart rate is 60 beats per minute to maybe 180 or 120 beats per minute, one to two hertz or one to three hertz. So it is reasonable to say, apply a equivalent bandpass filtering to limit the frequency range so that you can get a meaningful, a clean a estimated RPPG signal. So I'm going to talk about three different approaches. Um, 
So uh, the first two uh, are uh, basically approaches try to increase the signal to noise ratio of the RPBG while to reject other unwanted noise. Sometimes they may be stronger than the RPBG signal. The third approach will be a statistical method uh, based on the source separation algorithm. And then I will also talk about deep, deep learning based approaches. And we'll see that. Uh, so deep learning is actually also very good at extracting the, um, the APG signals that we want. And we will ma mainly look at the structures. Uh, so Ming have already shown a picture of this. Uh, so this is a cross-sectional structure of a human skin. Uh, so we have uh, three layers, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. So you can see that the blood vessel is at the bottom layer, and then we have some uh, small capillaries. Uh, so these are the like the hairy like blood vessels. So um, so these are actually the medium that contains the RPPG signals that we want. Uh, so suppose we have a light shining on the human skin. It is called IFT, uh, and it will actually have two uh, outcomes. Why is that? Um, uh, because maybe my skin is oily and then there will be a direct specular reflection component. Um, specular reflection component directly go back to the camera. So the incidence angle will equal to the reflection angle. So this is one uh, easy one, but this will be the component that we do not want because it does not interact with the blood and to, to get us the information back to the camera. The second component is the light source uh, will transmit into uh, the tissue uh, of the human skin and then start to interact with the red blood cells in capillaries and the blood vessel. And eventually they will find their way to go out. Uh, so this is the diffuse reflection component. Or if you want, you can say it is a re-emitted uh, um, component. So once we have these two components, uh, also we also have other noise and the capture and the camera sensor will capture uh, these reflection components. So it is reasonable to do a simplified um, signal processing based modeling uh, to, to eventually arrive at three components. The first is the pulse component that we're interested in. The second is the specula that I have talked about. And the third is an intensity that's overall bias. Um, so all these three components are time varying. So what we need is the, the this more periodic component, the pulse component, and we need to figure out a way to reject this specular component and the intensity component, keep in mind that they are time varying. So it is kind of non-trivial to deal with them. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have the symbol uh, C sub N of T. Uh, so you can consider this if you let the T go from one, two, three, four, up to maybe 1,000 data points. So we can consider this C uh, sub N this as a three by 1,000 matrix, as I illustrated here. Uh, so the three comes from the RGB channel. So each channel will have a signal, a horizontal row, and then we stack them together, and then we will use it on the next slide. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce uh, the uh, two principal signal processing-based algorithm, uh, which they share the similarity that they want to remove uh, both the specular components and the intensity component. Uh, so uh, the nice part of those signal processing-based approaches is that uh, they are mainly linear in operations, as we, we can see later. So the only difference between the POS of the pass algorithm, the CROM algorithm, that is that one actually removes intensity first and then removes the specular. The other removes the specular first and then removes intensity. Uh, so let's go into a little bit uh, into the algorithm to appreciate how our signal processing based uh, uh, mindset can, can help to like increase the signal to noise ratio of the interest of the signal that we're interested in. Uh, so let's first look at the POS, the past algorithm, and the full name is a plain orthogonal to the skin uh, algorithm. Uh, so 
First, it will actually remove the intensity components or the bias components or the DC component through an orthogonal projection. Uh, so the process is just a linear transform by a matrix, a P matrix, this is a projection matrix. This matrix is um, of two rows and the three columns. Uh, if you still have a little bit of memory about the CM matrix, so I said it is a three by 1,000 if we assume that we have 1,000 data points along the time. So eventually after multiplying our projection uh, onto this P matrix, you will get an, an S matrix, which is, which is of two by 1,000. So basically you get, get two horizontal signal. Uh, one is power, uh, is a result of the first row and the second is a result of the second row. So as you can see here, the first row is actually 0, 1, minus 1, which corresponds to weight for R, G, and B. Uh, so basically, the, the first row, that we can call it this intermediate signal, is a linear combination of the uh, uh, green and the blue, but it's green minus blue. Similarly, the second row is actually uh, containing a linear combination of minus two parts of uh, red and uh, one part of green and one part of blue. So you, you can see that uh, we actually are doing linear combination here to get two intermediate signals. Uh, so these two rows, we later call them S1 and S2, but I will talk about them later. I want, you, I want to draw your attention here that uh, you can see the both row, they have uh, Futures that are reject, rejecting the DC components uh, because the coefficient for the first row, if you add them up, they become zero. So the no DC can pass. And the second one is also the same. So they sum up to zero. So the first step actually have, we have applied some DC rejection filters, uh, which is kind of a high pass or band pass filter, if you will, to talk about them from the signal processing perspective. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just how we do linear combination of the R, G, and the B channels to get some intermediate channels. Uh, so once we get the intermediate channels S1 and S2, uh, so the final uh, output of the estimated uh, PPG signal or remote PPG signal uh, P hat is actually uh, just a simple linear combination of S1 and S2. So, but with the weight one and alpha. Uh, so this weight alpha is related to the ratio between the standard deviation of the first signal and the second signal. Uh, so uh, you can see that if you plug this alpha into um, the front of S2, you will see S2 of T will be actually divided by the sigma S2. So this is equivalent an operation that you standardize the variance of the second intermediate signal. Once you standardize that, you multiply the sigma S1 to that standardized signal. So you scale up the standard deviation of that signal, and this standard deviation will match the standard deviation of S1. Uh, so in this way, um, so these two signals are combined. But why they did that? Uh, so in the paper, you can find the details. Uh, so because the S1 and S2, these two intermediate channels, they have an anti-phase uh, in the specular components. So if you sum them up in a correct way, so the phase component will actually, uh, sorry, the specular components will cancel out. Uh, however, the pulse components, they are actually in phase. So when you sum them up using a correct weight, so they will actually add it together. So at the end of the day, you will have a estimated RPBG signal um, from the pulse algorithm. So this algorithm looks pretty simple, right? We have two steps. Each step uh, is can be considered as mainly a linear combination operation, except that when we calculate alpha, we need to do some normalization. So then I will try to talk about the second one, which is a little bit more complicated than pulse algorithm that is called uh, a Chrome-based algorithm, Chrome algorithm, prominence-based RPPG. Uh, so this algorithm is a little bit different in terms that it does the specular component first and then remove the intensity. Uh, so the main difference is the first step. 
So it will actually do a so-called so-called white balancing, white balancing to to the to the signal. How 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 does it do? So it will actually calculate the average skin color vector okay, of a very large data set and try to figure out what is a, a good uh, matrix operation such that uh, the skin color will be normalized. Uh, once, so that, that matrix M is calculated, so it can be considered a wide balancing operator. So this operator, once it is multiplied to your um, signal R and G and the B time series, and then uh, it will actually try to leverage leverage the specular reflection component in each of the channel. So in each of the channel, after the specular reflection component are actually equivalent in strength, um, it doesn't matter how you do a linear combination of them. If the linear combination coefficient, they add up, add up to zero, then the specular component will go away. So that is the P matrix here, which is similar to the P matrix in the previous page, which you have a DC rejection filter. Uh, you have two DC rejection filters, similar here, but once they multiply the P matrix with the, this white balancing operator, the matrix looks a little bit different. But anyway, so, so this is a step that allows one to remove the specular component uh, first by doing some so-called white balancing so that you normalize the strength of the specular component in each channel. And then later uh, you do a linear combination that is DC rejection and then um, the specular component will go away. So finally, it will again do the um, these linear combination of S1 and S2, which are the intermediate channels based on, uh, uh, based on the standard deviation adjustment that, that can be done. Uh, so these two algorithms uh, are are of the type that uh, we try to kind of increase signal to noise ratio by rejecting the components that we didn't want. Uh, so we can go back to here. So we actually are interested in this diffuse refreshing component that in, contains the information that after the light is interacting uh, with the capillaries and the blood vessels. We don't really want the specular reflection and we don't want the intensity, which is kind of time varying DC bias. So uh, there's a third one, uh, which is more based on statistical signal processing. There's a source separation algorithm. Uh, so uh, for the goal of this so-called joint blind source separation algorithm, uh, it actually looks for a common pulse signal that exists in in, in multiple measurements uh, of, uh, of the signal of interest. So in, in this paper that we cited here and we are presenting here, uh, they can see the four separate uh, different measurements. Okay, so how, they, how do they do it? Okay, so they use a, the first step is a landmark detector uh, to try to look at all those important landmark, landmarks on the face. And then they cut it, the face into four different regions and consider each region uh, as one measurement. As one measurement, how is the measurement looks like? Uh, so they they actually average the intensity within each of the measurements. So they will get a, a R time series, a G time series, and a B time series. Again, so it can be written as a three by n matrix. Now let's take n equals to one thousand. And in this case, uh, they have one, two, three, four, four different subregions. So the idea behind is that uh, for each of these measurements, say the measurement from the subregion, we know that it is caused partially by the RPPG or the PPG signal. So that signal should exist. Of course, there exists some other signals. And we will assume that this RGB each of them will be a kind of a linear combination of the signal that we want, this underlying signals, and a range of other signals that we are not really interested in. But anyway, we are going to estimate them, or we are going to separate them. So let's look at how practically this RP, uh, the JBSS algorithm is working uh, for this heart rate um, uh, problem or for this RPPG problem. So this X super M is the 
uh, signals the four measurements that we obtained. So this small m ranges from one to four. Okay, in our previous case, we have four different regions. And the, the xm is our measurement, which is three by 1000 matrix each. And uh, we have a mixing matrix that is going to mix some underlying signal as super m. So it has say L channels and uh, so, so that's, so we said the L equals to 1000. Uh, sorry, sorry, the L, uh, say, let's use a good number, like L equals to five. So the SM is a matrix of five times 1000. So you have A, which is three times five, and the SM is five times 1000. So the multiplication gives you three times 1000. So that's the dimension of you know, one of the measurements, right? And we assume L equals to five. So we are assuming there are five underlying signals and one of them must be the RPG signal. So that, that is our assumption. So we have a source separation problem that we want to separate the true sources in X uh, into the S, S matrix. However, we also don't know the mixing matrix A. So this is actually a blind source separation problem. And because we have four different areas in the phase, so this is a joint blind source separation problem jointly using the four different areas. Uh, so the bottom part, uh, we are showing this JBSS process. You can assume that we have four of these measurements. And then on the right-hand side, uh, these are the estimates uh, of the JBSS. You can see that I have highlighted the first row uh, of the S super one and the S super K. So this hat means that this is an estimated signal already um, returned by the algorithm. Uh, you can see that uh, this first signal is, is very similar except why is a kind of flipped version of another. So you can simply assume that there's a minus sign here, difference here. So, how does this JBSS algorithm actually works? So, so the idea is also relatively simple. So if we assume that there is an underlying common signal among different measurements, X1, X2, and up to X4, then uh, we are going to say that if we get some intermediate estimated, estimated results, right? So we want to make sure that across different measurements, the correlations are relatively high, right? And then, so if we get high correlation and then usually are going to be very similar. And there's another assumption uh, originally come from, coming from the source separation algorithm that uh, each of the components with each measurement, like the three components in S hat one, so they should be statistically independent. Uh, so once you have a cost function like this, and then the, the algorithm can return certain results to you. Okay, so the JBSS has been very popular in uh, biomedical signal processing. Um, it, it is powerful in certain applications, but, but sometimes it's hit or miss and they, it, there's certain cavities behind it. Uh, okay, so uh, we have already talked about three principled approach uh, from the signal processing perspective. Uh, yet uh, in the neural network, um, in the machine learning field, people are also trying to apply neural networks. Uh, and the one approach, and um, we, we will actually talk about three approaches. One, the physical net, physics net. Uh, so it will input to a neural network a sequence of images. So this is basically a video and it will be putting that through a 3D convolution structure. So normally for image tasks, we do 2D convolution. And if we are using a 3D convolution, that means we also kind of implicitly assume some of the like, stationarity of uh, linear time invariance along the time. So, so that, that's kind of well justified, but you can see that their convolution layer is like three by three by three. So that is not really capturing a lot of time, uh, time dependency. Uh, so anyway, so, so after you pass through this 3D convolution, you take into consideration the correlation along the time, 
but we don't know what is kind of this correlation. We just let a neural network uh, use the data to, to tell us. So we train it and then eventually they will learn the weights. You can see that they have this 3D convolution structure repeated for four times. So there will be a lot of nonlinearity um, inside them because don't forget, after doing these convolution things, usually we have a, a pooling layer, like here the max pooling, and at certain times we have the value function. So there are a lot of uh, linearities, if you want to call them, um, built into this structure, and then uh, it will be very expressive. The neural network will be very expressive, will be capable of learning the dynamics of the signal that we have. So this is the first one. Um, the, the second one is uh, starting to be more complicated. Uh, so the basic idea of the second one is that uh, and for the lower branch, as you can see here, so they have a like a saliency map or attention map or importance map mechanism or origin of interest mechanism, but it's a soft one. So it will actually take as input these appearance images and then we, we, we will start to process that like a standard neural network, convolutional neural network structure, and then they will get the rough looking of the person. So that will emphasize uh, in a soft manner, the pixels on the face and so on and so forth. So once this information is ready, so they will actually send this information to the upper pipeline, which is a true uh, RPPG extraction algorithm. So how, how, how do, do we do it? So basically the idea of this approach is that they do not really uh, directly work on the original image that um, they have, but instead they send in a consecutive two images, CT and the CT plus one. And then they send in the so-called normalized difference. So the, they get the difference between two images and divide by the sum of these two. So this is a, this is a normalization. So the idea is that they send in the difference the signal. Of course, at the output, they will get some difference the output, which is the difference the RPVG. And then you can do the accumulation or you can call it the integration in the continuous time so that to get back an estimated RPVG signal. So the internal structure uh, doesn't really matter too much. So this is standard, right? Standard multi-layer um, multi neural network, and then it just crunch the data. So the goal for this kind of um, neural network structure is they, they try to ca capture the motion. Uh, they call, call this, this difference method like the motion model. Uh, if, you, if you ever know the, the, how the GIF images are kind of compressed, so basically this, they are using the difference between the previous frame and the current frame and then encode the, the difference. And then if you have a larger motion and then of course you have more intent content here and then the, the neural network, your neural training will adjust accordingly uh, by using those weights. So again, we have a lot of parameters here. Uh, so it is very expressive neural network and they should be able to learn things. Uh, so the last one uh, neural network approach I want to talk about uh, is even more complicated, but this also gives you some principle, the feeling of what's going on and that you have certain explanations. Uh, so this one uh, has two components. Uh, first is the pre-processing part, the second is the main net neural network part. So the pre-processing part of the neural network, uh, so it does uh, process your uh, input volume uh, video uh, video into some uh, tense, uh, a three-dimensional array. And then later they use this three-dimensional array to, to do the signal uh, RPPG extraction. Uh, so how do they do it? So they will actually kind of, uh, try to uh, find one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, different uh, region of interest. And then they have actually create all combinations of these in, region of interest, they call the ROI combinations. And then they will use RGB channel, YUV channel, six channel, and then they will create all those combinations. And then they create a time series. Uh, time. They will stack all those time series into in, in another two dimension. So you have a 3D volume. So once you have a, this kind of 3D volume, you can kind of 
feel that, oh, we have a better um, representation in terms of the uh, heart beat signal or the RPPG signal instead of the motion signals that goes here and there because how they then generate each of the signal, they actually do the spatial average over each of the region interest. So once they have the volume, a 3D volume, they have, first they are going to use a autoencoder structure and there's a self-supervised learning process to kind of create a bottleneck layer at the middle. And then, so this middle FP1, FP, FP1, so on and so forth, and they are a concise representation uh, of of what the original volume was. And then later they are going to use this compressed, so-called compressed or concise representation uh, for uh, two tasks. One is the heart rate value prediction. The other is the signal shape prediction, the RPPG prediction. So because they are doing, they are using the same uh, network doing two different tasks. So it is understandable that in general, the uh, the neural network will generalize better and uh, it will not significantly overfit. Yeah, so, so these are the approaches that we have talked about. We have talked about, uh, the already talked about how RPPG signals can be obtained by, um, by this traditional signal process based approach. We do lin linear combination, use the pause and the Chrome algorithm, and then we can do the source separation approach. And now I, I'm going to shift a little bit to talk about um, the steps before and after this PPG extraction stage. Okay, so it is good that we are in the PPG extraction stage, but before that, we need to do the pre-processing. And after that, we need to do post-processing. And in option cases, we have to like encounter the scenario that we, we need to increase the signal to noise ratio. And um, it is very common in the forensics community that we are dealing with this low SNR scenarios. So once we can do a good job in terms of increasing the SNR at each of the stage, so it will ultimately benefit some of the downstream tasks, such as if we want to do half rate estimation, we will get better half rate estimates. Okay, so Ming have already talked about the motivated about micro signal. So I just want to uh, add that micro signal is not something that we are not familiar with, but uh, in the context of forensics community, because we are dealing with this kind of signal every day. So the magnitude is usually more than one order magnitude, magnitude smaller. So we do probably, it's easier to have a name for it so that this notion will, will keep us moving to, to focus on the smaller signal that are of interest. Uh, one example um, is that for the PRNU camera unit identification um, um, uh, research, right? So each, each color sensor, they have slightly different biases but these biases are so small that they, they are below the quantization threshold uh, of those uh, a bit images, right? But if you average over 100 or even 1,000 images, um, the smooth images, and then due to the, C, the, the, the central limit theorem, the, the, the bias will come out, right? And variance will shrink. So, so that is a very nice, um, mindset of this traditional signal processing based approach that we are able to deal with this uh, micro signal using, uh, using certain statistical tools. And then, um, so today um, our focus is on the physiological uh, signal measurement and we will use the half rate um, or RPPG signal estimation as an example uh, to talk about uh, how in general we can and of them use different strategies to uh, approach these problems. So uh, there are a, a couple of different strategies. Um, so one, one interesting strategy, uh, which has been very widely used is to, to, maybe we can call the residue analysis. So in this scenario, usually our signal of interest is of very low magnitude and there is a dominating signal, or we maybe we call it the host signal or whatever, so have a much stronger magnitude. Um, to a certain extent, in this scenario, we can find that, oh, we are able to actually estimate pretty well this dominating signal. Uh, so from this 
kind of a noisy sinusoidal shape. Uh, once we kind of estimate that, maybe we have a parametric model, or maybe we have non-parametric model. So it doesn't matter. So we can even have the domain knowledge to, to improve the shape of its estimation. So once we get good estimation, we can uh, get our signal interest by directly subtracting right from the original signal. Uh, so in statistical literature, they call this they think V trending, but in signal processing, especially if you start to work with uh, image and video, so it is more than trend. Uh, a lot of things are non-parametric. And the important thing is that how can you get this estimated trend? So we will talk about um, an example using the, the video as an example. So the other two approaches uh, maybe uh, and less, less often used, but kind of like it's off the shelf. The second one is more off the shelf. Uh, so this is statistical source separation. I have talked about one applied source separation based approach. We assume uh, there are underlying signals. One signal, uh, underlying signal is actually the signal of interest. And then we assume the independence and we separate them. If we have multiple measurements, we can do a joint estimation. We can increase this SNR for our estimated signal. Um, so yeah, so sometimes it, this kind of algorithm is hit or miss. So it's it's off the shelf and it's good to try. And the third approach um, is kind of like if we understand certain physical characteristic or modeling behavior of the signal, um, so then we can directly attract this. So this one is slightly different from the first one. The first one we actually assume uh, we kind of know the certain behavior of the signal or the dominating signal. But in the third one, third approach, we actually know the, the, the behavior of the signal that we're interested in. We know the behavior of the micro signal. So let me don't get into that. Uh, so let's, let me show an example of residual analysis using video signal. So, so this is a video that um, someone is running. So it actually was me five years ago, uh, running on a treadmill and uh, What's the goal? The goal is to extract the heart rate signal from this video, okay? So uh, heart rate is actually making my face changing color in a subtle way periodically. Uh, we can also see uh, this person is also running periodically left and right and up and down. So how can we do it? Maybe we can try to do a naive way. We pick a point on the face and the measure it's time series to measure the signal. And you can see that this point is actually, this point is actually going to be on the face for a while and off the face for a while. And then obviously it's not going to be a good signal. So we actually say that the emotion artifacts dominate the signal. So our subtle color change, the RTBG component will not come out without really trying to kind of deal with this video. How, how can we do that? One idea is that we can stabilize the video, right? So if you are interested in looking at the color change of this point on my face, I hope you can see the video of me now. So, and then no matter how I shake my head, this, this point should be like a specific point on my face. So the idea is that why not we can like just stabilize the video Right, using certain techniques. You can find an artist to do it in Photoshop, but usually it's too complicated. So we have very stable and this robust algorithm in um, motion estimation and motion compensation to do that. Uh, so for some of you maybe not very familiar with motion estimation, let me talk about it, uh, quickly talk about it. So motion estimation, we, we basically are looking at the two different images. Um, they are slightly, usually slightly different, and there is slight motion. We assume that every single point on the face is actually going to have the same intensity. So that's why I have the equation here. The intensity of the reference frame into, is equal to the intensity of the target frame. The only difference is that uh, for the point x, i, y, i on the left image, so it has been moved uh, by a small displacement of the delta xi and the delta yi. So this is a small displacement. So you can have some patient to manually draw it on the, on the screen, but we do have traditional signal processing based approach to estimate the motion matters. Uh, you can use optical flow or you can use the neural network to estimate 
the optical flow uh, to estimate the motion matrix. Uh, you can even use a coarse way, like blob-based motion estimation to estimate those correspondence, so on and so forth. Anyway, so assume that we are able to get all the motion vectors for all the pixels on the left, left image and the right image. And then once we have that, we can actually wrap, wrap the right target image uh, into the looking of the left image. Okay, so you, again, you can ask the artist to do that, but writing an algorithm is easier by just providing all the motion vectors here. Right. So, so once you do that, and then the uh, phase is stabilized. So let me show a video of this motion, motion compensation uh, result. Uh, you will see this video again for the more broader result, but I'm just showing for the motion compensation result. So this is my colleague, uh, Chang Zhu, and uh, he's moving. And then here, um, every two seconds, we actually choose a reference frame. And we want to stabilize the remaining frames to the reference frame. So we have 20, uh, we have 30 frames per second. We are going to stabilize 59 frames per two minutes. So you can see that once the guide, the head is fixed, you can uh, extract certain pixel intensity and then it, it will give you a very stable measurement. Hopefully they are periodic, sometimes they're not. So we still need to do the post-processing. On the right-hand side, this is a residue image residue video. Uh, so this video seems to be periodic, the greenish periodic, uh, but the periodicity you are seeing is actually caused by the period motion, of, caused by vertical or horizontal. We're still not completely getting rid of all the noises, quote, the noises we don't want, uh, but we are a big step forward. Okay. So, how to deal with that uh, motion trace. So, so this is another question that we usually encounter in forensics. Uh, even if we have done a good post pre-processing and then at the post-processing stage, we still face application, uh, still face difficulties, maybe because our estimation wasn't that, that precise. Maybe our algorithm for color channel combination is not 100% effective. So uh, we have to come up, so in this case, a kind of frequency estimation for, for forensic application. Uh, so the traditional frequency estimation or tracking algorithm, they probably usually focus on the bigger uh, hosse signal, right? They just to get the most strong yes, trace and that's it. But for our forensic applications, maybe my trace is 10, um, 10 times smaller in magnitude than the dominating signal. So we do need a general or universal method for frequency estimation of frequency tracking. So our idea is simple. So what we can do is to like apply the frequency tracking algorithm uh, iteratively. First, we estimate this dominating trace. Uh, I don't care what is this trace, but I just estimate it. Then I will compensate it by doing a notch filtering uh, along the time. So by the way, so this is a spatial gram. Horizontal axis is time. Vertical axis is the frequency and the intensity. So if you see more reddish, it is of higher power spatial density. If you see the bluish, so it is lower. Okay, so the strongest trace here is actually the vertical motion component. So we once we estimate that, we can do a notch filtering at each time step, and then just to erase it, to make it like a bluish. And then we will see, oh, so the pulse trace at the back is showing up. Uh, so this is the basic idea of our frequency tracking algorithm. And we actually can track it multiple traces simultaneously. We have an online version, we have an offline version, and that we have to use um, two techniques. One is the dynamic programming technique, which were inspired by the sync halving algorithm. And also we need to uh, regularize that uh, for my frequency tracking, the frequency should not jump up and down from one trace to another. So there will be some penalty added um, due to like the like the McCalvin penalties here. And then the sp spatial gram energy function is actually uh, kind of like a accumulated version of the current image 
current spectrogram image that we have. I assume that this image, the spectrogram image, you're looking from the top, and there are actually three uh, roughly parallel ridges in the, in the spectrogram image. So our cost function, the energy function, is a, a time accumulation of those ridges. So as time goes down, you will see the mountain uh, actually will go up, all the way up. So our algorithm is a, a capable of looking at, okay, at this time point, which ridge is the highest? And then I will go from this ridge all the way back to the starting time and decide this is my strongest trace. And then let's also get the second strongest trace. If there are some mistakes during this process, okay, we have a dynamic programming algorithm that can actually correct the mistake. So that's the essence of the dynamic, dynamic programming part. So once we have um, designed a uh, frequency tracking algorithm for our forensics application, so we can actually do uh, a, a examine how good it is. So uh, we um, so the left figure is the original spectrogram, and the mid figure we can see the reference hot trace is the uh, white dotted line. So the pink one, the purple one, is the one that due to the vertical motion. Uh, so we first estimate it and then get rid of that, and the algorithm will start to track the second one. You can see that the bluish line is our and this frequency tracking algorithms output. It matches with the uh, white line very good. So if we look at another reference algorithm, the particle filter plus the motion um, uh, motion notching algorithm, so the, the, the trace is more zigzag. So it has a higher va variance at certain time, it makes some mistakes, high bias, and so it's not as competitive as our um, uh, synergistically designed uh, multiple trace algorithm. Okay, so I will hand back to Ming um, at this part. So if the audience have any question, I can quickly address that. If yeah. not, we will Chow, move. Yes, Chow, I mean, I mean, there should be like a break of 30 minutes, right, William? Yeah, sure, uh, no problem. And I don't know if for you, which is the best moment to do this break? I don't know if there is some, there are some uh, constraints from the break. William, are there constraints for the break? Uh, we actually we could, uh, 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 yeah, could, could stop here okay. and then um, we can um, kind of uh, summarize what we have seen with some examples mm -hmm. and we move on um, in, in the next session. So this is a this should be a good point. Uh, if there is any um, quick questions, uh, we will be happy to to address. And we are certainly would uh, also have time uh, in the next uh, session um, to answer questions. So probably William, is it fine? Okay. So we stop now and then uh, we will. Okay. So in uh, we will uh, start again at four ten, right? Yes. Okay. So exactly. yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. Sure. So see you in thirty it's, uh, minutes. Ten ten um, in our time. Okay. Okay. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. See you.
Je voulais essayer. Euh... Hein oh. Ah. Ok. Ça, ça marche, mais ça marche pas sur le. Ça marche pas sur le hibou. Ça marche, c'est celui-là qui marche. Quoi Combien C'est les haut-parleurs. Euh, micro. Oui, mais Et donc je vais laisser. Ah, il faut le ensuite. Je... Mais après, à la fin, je viens quand même pour quand coupe le. Oui, c'est pas bon pour lui parce que tu C'est bizarre. One. Okay. Comment Ouais, mais quand j'ai mis celui-là. Si, si, si. Non, non, au début, il euh, y avait ça, parce que j'ai écouté aussi sur ma tablette, en fait. <rire> Regarde, sur ma tablette. Test. Ok. 
Ok. Okay, so good, good afternoon again. Uh, I think we can start, right, William? Are you ready? Yeah, it's okay in the room, yeah. Okay, okay. So, Min, you can start again for the second part of the tutorial. Sure. Um, so, for the, um, uh, we'll come back to our tutorial. Um, um, in the first section, um, we have given an overview and uh, uh, Zhao Wei had given a, a detailed discussion on how we uh, extract this uh, uh, image-based or remote-based PPG signals and how we cope with the various uh, movement uh, through this residual analysis and also track uh, very weak and noisy traces. Uh, if we put together uh, what we have seen this as uh, building blocks, uh, um, we would be able to not only looking at this resting case, but as you have seen, um, um, as people move around, which could be in um, some of this uh, um, um, athletic uh, uh, training cases, um, as well as, uh, for example, in uh, uh, driving safety and uh, in um, surveillance uh, situations um, where um, the uh, suspect uh, is moving around. So in all those cases, uh, we want to explicitly address movement um, and then um, uh, uh, stabilize the, uh, the frames to extract these very subtle changes. So here uh, we um, revisit the, uh, the example where uh, our co collaborator Chang Zhu um, is uh, running on an electric machine. And you can see that uh, with uh, the uh, face localizer, uh, there will be still some residual um, alignment issues. Uh, and then we do a high resolution motion analysis to stabilize uh, the face and then identify in this case, uh, the region of interest. Um, we could also um, try to account for all the usable skin pixels. Um, and then to combine those uh, uh, colors from the uh, usable um, skin pixels or region of interest and do the uh, frequency analysis. And you can see here after cleaning up, this is the spectrogram, the frequency over time. And this is what we um, have to summarize the overall results. The, um, uh, the black line is coming from a reference uh, where Chiang is actually also wearing uh, a chest belt um, that is considered as a gold standard uh, for measuring heart rate. Uh, uh, it's a form of uh, uh, one lead ECG signals uh, in sports and fitness. The red ones that was based only on the video after all this pipeline of analysis. And you can see mostly we're well within 1% of deviation from this reference. In comparison from the wearable signals, it's quite common to get three to 5% of the differences. Not only the um, the motion sensor itself uh, um, can handle some, but it by itself is quite noisy. And also the loose fitting uh, could introduce those artifacts. So that actually showing that it's potentially uh, the uh, imaging based modalities that using this uh, contact free sensing could be competitive uh, um, to other modalities. And here we um, summarize the overall pipelines uh, where we start with the video sequence uh, we located the face uh, and identified the facial region of interest. Um, and uh, this alone is not enough to, um, um, uh, and it would still give uh, some of the residual alignment issues. 
uh, a high resolution um, motion analysis will help us uh, uh, do the alignment. And Chawei had reviewed in detail um, the different studies, uh, uh, notably by the researchers from Philips uh, uh, Research in Netherlands, had done uh, various studies for example using PAUSE or Chrome as he reviewed to um, identify how we combine those colors that would be uh, mostly um, orthogonal or resilient to some of the small uh, motion residuals and be able to reflect the, uh, the pulse changes. And after that, we will pass this uh, into our uh, frequency um, uh, analyzer. And the, using this uh, general methodology so we can cope with uh, different type of motions, actually running a treadmill and elliptic curve uh, uh, it, it, uh, uh, machines um, is a relatively um, a moderate amount of motion. Certainly, it's, a, it's more than uh, the resting case. And uh, the, the talking head is very common in uh, telehealth as well as in this Zoom and uh, uh, interview situations. Uh, the motion from a uh, rolling, uh, 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 rolling machines um, to do this uh, fitness is actually much more profound. There is a significant horizontal movement. And because of those big movement, the lighting can also uh, impose some of the changes on the face. And those we can use some of the detraining so we cope with the motion and then deal with the lighting changes as a second layer and then looking at the residual signals. Um, so as Chawei mentioned, if we look at the um, how we cope with this. We actually had really leveraged a number of things we learned from other media forensics, uh, this residual analysis, trying to really address the dominant signal first, and then looking, uh, subtracting them or compensating them, and then review better the micro signals. It's common in many of forensic tasks. Um, camera forensics uh, um, and image uh, forensics are looking at uh, um, removing the scene content and then seeing some of the camera noise is one of the examples. Um, in Chawei's uh, dissertation work, uh, he had a look into um, these uh, very subtle um, um, microsurfaces. And I know um, in the web, though, you will also see a special session looking at some of the uh, these issues. So there, the, the, some of the over uh, lighting and the other conditions could present a dominant uh, um, uh, layers and we need to overcome them to review these subtle changes due to the underlying microsurfaces. So certainly in the, um, um, the uh, electrical power signature work uh, when um, they impose some of the small uh, micro signals onto the uh, audio or video, we also find um, the residual analysis help us cope with movement, cope with different uh, imaging effect. Um, so here, coping with the dominant uh, movement, as you can see, um, this uh, uh, this framework that uh, we already presented. And for tracking the noisy uh, traces you have seen in this uh, heart rate tracking, it's actually, we have a first seen this in the, um, in the power signature work from audio. And at the times, so, uh, depending on the um, different recording conditions, we will see the power traces in the sound reporting at least fade uh, very faintly. Our naked eye barely can tell that. Um, so using such uh, um, um, techniques that we, we develop uh, as uh, Chawei introduced, uh, help us cope with a uh, different kind of forensic uh, um, uh, uh, signals and analysis. This is actually from the radio frequency, which I will address later. Um, so he showed that the heart rate tracking and this uh, in our paper published actually in the TIFs, uh, um, you will see some examples for um, for different forensic uh, uh, modalities and applications. So when we revisit uh, our um, research issue roadmaps, uh, uh, we have addressed the various sensing, the roles of uh, uh, techniques uh, um, and uh, the synergy issues. So in this uh, part, uh, in this second part of the tutorial, we will talk about applications. I will pass the button first to um, Chao Wei to talk about uh, these very tiny issues of black oxygen um, um, monitoring without contact and also considering uh, respecting the privacy by looking at uh, a video monitoring of the hand uh, to track the uh, black oxygen. And then we will address deep fake and privacy issues. Thank you, Ming. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so in, in this part, uh, we'll switch the gear a little bit to look at another interesting physiological uh, modality, so called the blood oxygen level or SpO2. So we will look at how we can estimate it from uh, the remote modality, the video modality. So this SpO2 has gaining increasing popularity and attentions because it can be used for help diagnose COVID-19. Uh, we'll present some robust SpO2 estimation algorithm that we recently have been working on uh, to pave the way for its potential use in, in forensics. Uh, so let's talk about what is SpO2. SpO2 is, uh, is an important indicator of lung function. Uh, so it, it is a ratio between zero and one. Uh, so what it is about, it is about the saturation of the, of the blood oxygen. Uh, so here we have term, some terminologies of hemoglobin and uh, oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So, so these are the proteins that's in the red blood cell that can carry the oxygen. So if the blood cell is carrying the oxygen, then it is called oxygenated hemoglobin or uh, SpO2 or loosely HbO2. And then if it does not carry the, um, the oxygen, and then it is written as the uh, Hb. So the SpO2 is defined as the, the concentration of the uh, oxygenated hemoglobin over the total hemoglobins that we have. So a normal range of SpO2 for a healthy person in this sitting scenario is like 95 to 100%. I'm talking, maybe it's 96 when I am not talking, maybe it's 98 or 99. And uh, so if I exercise in real time, it could be something around like above 90. So if the SpO2 is below 80%, and then that, that is usually re related to certain long-term lung disease. And then recently, not really recently, one year ago when the COVID-19 started and uh, there were clinical findings seeing that patients can have at as low as 15%, 5-0% SpO2, while they are not looking so bad, they are still, still playing their phone in the hospital. So, so that's an important indicator for the um, like COVID-19 because COVID-19 have a special mechanism that prevent the, um, uh, uh, does not prevent the carbon dioxide to be released, but prevent oxygen to be um, intake into the lung. So there are different ways to measure SpO2. One is to use a very invasive approach, the arterial blood gas. gas you, use, uh, you, you, you need to perform, perform this operation uh, um, with the help of trained medical personnel. Another way is relatively easier. You just use a pulse oximeter uh, to plug in on your finger and then you can see the SpO2. Uh, so uh, in the, red, the next presentation, we will talk about um, first the, the working principle of this uh, contact-based tax oximeter. And then we will look at how we have modified it to using RGB cameras to capture or estimate this SpO2. Uh, with contactless or contact-free, we have unleashed a lot of opportunity for forensic application. So let's look at what is um, the working principle for the, um, the ox oximeter. So here, the left figure you can see, uh, so we have a finger inserting into an oximeter. And then we have uh, two LED lights. One is shining red light, the other is shining blue light. Uh, so at the bottom, so we have um, a sensor that captures the light that has transmitted through, through your tissue. Uh, so you can observe the distance of the transmission is actually almost the same. And uh, according to a so-called uh, Beer-Lambert law, the, the intensity of the light after transmitting through the tissue is actually um, proportional to an exponential decaying Thing. So, so what are these things? So one thing is that how far you have traveled, the light have traveled. So that's the L here. 
The second factor is what is the concentration uh, of the, the material in your blood? Basically, it is the oxygenated hemoglobin. And uh, the third term is the absorption coefficient. Um, so the absorption coefficient is the amount of the, 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 the percentage, right? The, the, it can be, um, the, the material can absorb. Uh, absorb. So it can, we can measure, so one can measure the absorption coefficient for uh, the, the oxygenated hemoglobin and also the oxygenated hemoglobin. So on the right figure, you can see, uh, so we are looking at the absorption coefficient for uh, HB and HPO2 as a function of wavelengths. So it is interesting to observe that uh, for the black, for the red and the blue region, for the red and the blue region, you can see that there will be difference in absorption coefficient. So that implies that once you have a, a different wavelength, right, passing through your, your skin, uh, passing through your tissue, the output uh, of the intensity will be, will be different. So the idea of the Pax oximeter is to use this different output on the different wavelengths to estimate your, uh, uh, your concentration of the blood, uh, the concentration of the oxygen in your blood. So through some of the derivations, we can show that with certain approximation, we can show that uh, the SpO2 level, this percentage is actually uh, proportional, is a linear function of some ratio of ratio. So the ratio of ratio is actually a very easy to understand term. So it is actually the AC component uh, over divided by the DC component, AC strength over the DC strength for uh, the first wavelength uh, divided by AC over DC of another wave, wave, wavelength strength. So you have AC over DC, so that's a ratio uh, measuring how strong the, the the sinusoidal varying part um, uh, is related to the DC bias. And so the ratio of ratio is because we have two ratios divided together. Uh, so here in this example, people have used this 660, this red, and the lambda two is 940, that's infrared to, to try to estimate, help calculate the SpO2. But practically, so if we want to do an SpO2 estimation using RGB camera, and then we better to find another wavelength that we actually have in our camera. So the infrared is not going to be used. So we search the figure and we see that there's a lot of discrepancy between these two different materials in our blood uh, at this blue, blue region. So maybe we can use the red and blue cha camera channels to to replace right the, the sensor that this LED light here. Yes, yeah, so there are multiple work in the literature have been replacing the uh, inf uh, the LED uh, by using the visible visible lights. Uh, so, however, so visible and um, RGB channels are kind of different from LED because for visible channels we have a wide uh, response um, in this uh, this power. Uh, special in the for, for the light, our special domain, the light. You can see that uh, it is not as single peaked as these two lines, like the red and infrared. So we actually are getting more information into our sensors. And so as your integration goes, the whole range and the discrepancy between the red here is actually going to be reduced. So this, this is one shortcoming. But on the other hand, if you take a look, if you use the green channel to, to do the sensing, sensing green LED light at 540 hertz, you are not going to get any performance difference, right, for the HB and the HBO2. However, if you use the green color channel in your camera, so it actually integrates a wider range, so it can provide more information. So we have the both uh, blessing, uh, so, so, so we have both opportunity and the challenges in terms of using RGB camera to kind of code to replace the, um, the LED light for, for, for the um, oximeter sensing modality.
So we will look into how we can make uh, exploit this kind of opportunity to make SPO to act estimation more precise. So the idea of doing um, this remote based SPO to estimation uh, will need to deal with motion because for video, if I move around, so there will be um, this visible, visible motions and also the motion will cause color change because the, the light is actually hitting my face at a certain angle, but my face will rotate. So the color will also be affected. Uh, so um, we, we wanted to try a more uh, controlled scenario. So uh, why not let's start with hands? So we don't have constraints in terms of privacy. We don't, uh, we can put the hand pretty still and then we can look at uh, to a certain extent how much we can push the boundary to improve the SPO2 estimation by using the, the remote camera, the contact-based modality. And then later we can uh, transfer it to the facial scenario, but we need to take, take care of the privacy issue. And the main we'll talk about how we can protect the privacy of the person by doing some of the transformation of the face later in this part. Uh, so the traditional approach um, using ratio of ratio method, as I mentioned before, they just use uh, just two color channels uh, or two frequency bands, lambda one and lambda two. So they just get one ratio and SPO2 is a function of one feature, ROR, or one predictor, um, if you use a statistical language. But what we are proposing is to uh, add five different more features. So we had this ROR comma uh, RB, so the red and blue channel, but we also add the ratio of ratio between red and green channel, the green and the blue channel, and also we add the ratios themselves, R of red, R of green, R of B. So why do we do that? Because we said uh, this uh, RGB camera has a wider response. So it is actually capturing more information in a integrated way. So there will be integration. So things are mixed together. And we have more information, but they are summarized in a way that not, a, not the best for us to, to demix. But why not? Let's just put them as a features of predictors for linear regression. Let's see how, how it goes. And also another thing is that uh, if we have um, like motion, if we have motion, we have a shake of the hands, we need to remove those motions. So we, we do need to uh, apply a certain band pass filter, but not all kinds of band pass filter. We need the band pass filter to be very precise in terms of the frequency that we are looking at. So that's how the previous uh, multiple uh, trace and frequency tracking algorithm plays a role here. So this is an, uh, a result, a preliminary results that we obtained. Um, so, so the blue, uh, so the horizontal axis is time, vertical axis is SPO2 level. Uh, so the black curve is the predicted one, the blue, uh, sorry, the red dashed one is the reference uh, obtained by the, uh, uh, um, obtained by oximeter. So we can see that for a good media and the worst case, we are kind of getting the overall trend of the up and downs of the SPO2. Uh, by the way, during the experiment, we asked the sub subjects to hold their breath and then for repeated uh, three cycles. So you can see when they are holding breath, so the SPO2 can drop uh, up to 90 and then it will come back up and then drop again, so on and so forth. Okay. So, we have used the PSN correlation and the mean absolute error, these two metrics to measure the uh, performance. Uh, the PSN correlation captures the overall trend reasonably well, uh, but it does, it's not sensitive to the shift, right? The bias. Mean absolute error is good at looking at the overall difference, but if the shape is off and then it's not very sensitive, the example is that I can use a, a naive predictor always outputting 96% and my, my overall mean absolute error will be plus or minus like, like 4%. So both metrics needs to be used simultaneously to measure the performance of this SPO2 prediction. So 
we actually are doing quite well compared to other uh, methods. And uh, we have looking to, because this is a kind of uh, like um, principled approach, we designed the whole signal processing system. So we actually were able to analyze which components in the system are actually contributing to the performance. So we can see that. Uh, so if we use the RGB features, instead of just using one of the features, uh, we use six features instead of one. So the performance will have the most significant improvement from 0.22% uh, to 68% in our proposed method. Uh, so uh, other contributions like we should use adaptive band pass filtering to do the extraction instead of using, say, a generic band pass filter sitting at somewhere and uh, sit still. Right? So this one to two hertz cars about 60 to 120 beats per minute. And uh, we also look at, oh, if the band pass filter is kind of too wide, even if it is kind of adaptive along the time, it's not going to help too much. So basically it tells that uh, we need to get the so-called AC component very precisely at the frequency that it actually was. Uh, we, we should not get a lot of kind of neighboring AC components that caused by the frequency leakage, and then that will ru ruin the SNR of our problem. And uh, yeah, of course, by using the, um, the adaptive multi-trace tracking algorithm, we can also get a certain 10% improvement. So we have also looked at the, the contribution of the skin color, but due to the limitation of time, so I will not pre present the details. Um, so we actually have um, captured the data at the different color, skin color type, and then we look at for the lighter and the darker skin color group, uh, what will be the effect of them if I, my, my, my hand is facing up to, towards the camera or facing down. Right, so the backside is facing towards the camera. So overall, we, we see that um, there are not so significant performance in terms of the face color, the, the skin color. So this is different from the half rate or RPPG estimation. In that case, we are looking at the absolute intensity that's reflected by the, uh, by the skin. So, so there is an SNR issue related to the skin color. However, in this SP2 estimation, so this is different. So we are not looking at the absolute intensity, but we are looking at the ratio of the two different color bands or multiple color bands. So it is, we are looking at the differential. So this differential is less affected by the native skin color of a person. Uh, so I'm happy to talk more about it if you have further questions. So we've tried signal processing based approach principle, but then we ask, oh, can we also use a neural network to do similar thing? But of course, we're not going to grab a ResNet and then just train it and then let's see what's going on. So that is not our style. So we want explainable, not us, the neural network community, machine learning community, they like explainable. So we try to see, oh, maybe we can be inspired by our principled approaches in the literature and see how we can design neural networks. So yes, yeah, so here comes the idea. So if we are inspired by the heart rate estimate, estimation approach, basically we need to do what? We need to do the color channel combinations first, like the post and the Chrome algorithm has been doing. They combined RGB into uh, one RPBG signal. So the combination is most linear, but overall it's non-linear. And, uh, and then we can also try this ratio of ratio methods, which actually um, I didn't talk about the details, but they actually do the uh, channel mixing later, but they do the feature extraction first. So motivated by these two different models, we created two model structures, model one and model two. You can see here uh, from the left, align, left to right. So we, are, we have the input layer and mid layer and the upper layer. So for the model one, you can see that uh, the color channel along this horizontal-ish axis. So we are trying to um, first amplify three color channel into many color channels, and then we gradually uh, combine them, combine them, com combine them. So uh, each step is a nonlinear process. So overall, it's a nonlinear chan color channel combination. 
once we combine enough, uh, so that it's ending here, the orange-ish, so we start to do the spatial, uh, sorry, we, we try to extract this, the temporal frequent, the temporal uh, feature along the time. So the vertical axis is time. So you can see we reduce it by half, reduce it by half, and so, on, so forth. So finally, we get one point, which is the SpO2 value that we are doing a regression on. So this is model one inspired by heart rate, but model two, we first do this uh, temporal feature extraction. Um, so the blue ones, they are getting half and half each time. And then we do uh, a lot of a channel, color channels, and we, we, we do a nonlinear combination. So both model one and model two are kind of motivated by the principled approach. Then we ask, can we just mix those two ideas together? We do the feature uh, extraction and the channel combination simultaneously. So that came the third model. Okay, so we, we ran our algorithm and the pretty, uh, pretty nicely, we, we get some interesting results. Uh, so, so here we can see that um, I have uh, the figures, horizontal is time vertical is SPO2 level. So we have the training data uh, for the last two cycles here. And uh, we have the validation data, which is used to select which neural net um, model we are going to use for testing. So the left part, the left panel is basically overall is a training process. The right part is the testing result. Uh, we are testing on a signal that we have not seen before. So in this case, this is a participant specific testing, which means that uh, so uh, the test signal is actually coming from the same person, but measured at a different session. So we can see overall the SPO2 chain has been tracked reasonably well, uh, but there is more zigzag up and down here um, that of course needs improvement. And we compared with the result in the literature uh, by Scali et al. and Ding et al. Uh, we measure in correlation, we almost get more than 40% correlation of the, in the literature, they get less than 20% or less than 40%. If we measure the mean absolute error, uh, we try to rule out those naive predictors that always output the 97 SPO2 a prediction. So we can see actually Scali at all uh, is actually kind of a, a naive predictor. It doesn't perform too well. And the thing at all, you can see the MAE is also, mean absolute error is also very large. So it means that the variance of the predictor uh, in the, and by being at all is, is not that good. Okay, so I will uh, hand it back to Ming to talk about uh, how we can use the physiological um, signal to detect the deep fake uh, videos. Thank you, Charlie. Um, so, so far we have uh, uh, spent most of the time to look at how we can effectively um, um, extract uh, various uh, physiological signals, including to understanding their biophysical mechanisms, and then looking at how we can use uh, computer vision, image, video processing, and signal processing to extract them. And as uh, for our forensic uh, community, um, detecting forgery, especially um, those uh, um, um, deep fake based uh, um, uh, forge uh, uh, face uh, generations has been um, uh, attracting a lot of attention. And we want to um, also see how we could uh, utilize these uh, physiological modalities uh, to contribute to fighting against the forgery. And as uh, um, um, quite some of our colleagues uh, working in this uh, forgery detection areas uh, um, have seen um, from both uh, our forensic communities in the uh, Wilson uh, publication venue, as well as in computer vision communities, uh, um, um, quite a lot of attention has been given to um, detect uh, some of the behavior patterns. Um, and for example, in terms of uh, tracking um, lip or mouth movement, the blinking behavior, the pose uh, consistencies of head, uh, facial features uh, um, in conjunction with uh, head movement or separate, 
um, and also some of those subtle motions, such as the ear or motions. And um, in those situations, we often will have a conjecture on um, what kind of uh, uh, movement or behavior patterns will be considered uh, as naturally occurring and whether they are present in the video. And the underlying assumption is if uh, the forger um, to create this uh, uh, deep uh, fake uh, video uh, may not be aware of those natural behavior, we may be able to see some of the anomaly. Um, so you can see many of this identify certain behavior traits, uh, use various, uh, for example, image video analysis, uh, both spatially and temporally um, to extract them and then use various learning mechanisms, both in terms of the, the more classic uh, um, uh, uh, classifiers or use uh, uh, abundant data to train uh, for the classes of the genuine video versus uh, forged video. So naturally, when um, we have seen this uh, uh, physiological uh, signal extractions from video, uh, we will see uh, how this uh, could uh, uh, work. And uh, one of the first work uh, was by uh, Professor Li Junyin's uh, group uh, at Bingen University. Um, and they look at uh, um, extracting the, from the video, especially zooming in to the facial and skin area to extract the, uh, the PPG or we call them as RPPG signal. And their underlying assumption is they are conjecturing that uh, um, in a phaged, you uh, know, in, in a forged video, um, those uh, um, um, PPG signal may not be preserved or may be perturbed. Um, so what they did is they have used uh, some of the structured way to um, um, to extract the the PPG, the heartbeat signals from the skin area, and then um, use uh, a, a CNN to uh, compare those signals from a naturally occurring recorded video versus the forged ones, and then to detect uh, the anomaly when, when they can separate those uh, uh, by aggregating some of these uh, different cues, uh, they are able to achieve good classification. Again, here the underlying assumption um, is uh, um, the forger may not be fully aware uh, of the use of a PPG signal. Another recent work uh, published uh, um, in last year's uh, um, ACM Multimedia Conference uh, uh, use a more uh, sophisticated uh, deep learning framework to look at the spatial and temporal attention models and then uh, looking at uh, um, making this uh, a real versus a, a, a fake uh, a classification. Um, now, so naturally, as we work in this area, it's really also depending on who has the upper hand. Uh, if the forger has a really good uh, grasp and uh, understanding all these underlying mechanisms and have really good uh, um, remote PPG extractions, they actually could potentially do quite a lot of things. For example, naturally from our forensic thinking and we would, or adversarial thinking, we could think about the adversary could try to remove the heart rate or restore the heart rate um, at their will. Um, so along that line, uh, we actually have utilized uh, our expertise initially focusing on how we can extract this uh, RPPG signal um, and uh, monitor and track the heartbeat and heart rate more accurately over time and use that as a building block to see uh, could we actually remove the heart rate trace. And that actually have a, a profound need uh, in terms of protecting the privacy of a person. Um, if you um, look at this uh, uh, video analysis for um, not by law enforcement, but for legitimate purposes, for example, um, in sports broadcasting, uh, before uh, the, uh, the uh, physiological conditions of your favorite athletes are uh, only known to themselves and their doctors. But now with this uh, new technologies, uh, any fans could potentially um, um, purchase uh, such services and be able to know the uh, physiological conditions and the health conditions of their, uh, their favorite athlete. But this also has really raised a lot of privacy concerns um, in this domain 
uh, in pole sports as well as in more generally um, uh, other areas. Um, so one of the, um, and you can think about uh, um, if we could uh, monitor um, the, um, the health conditions of, uh, um, of the celebrities or uh, political figures. Um, so uh, there is really a need how we could in um, um, legitimate purposes uh, uh, to try to remove those uh, um, uh, heart, heart trace from the video so that we can uh, protect those sensitive health information. And certainly as we just motivated for analyzing the effectiveness and the limitations of deep fake detection tool and to build more powerful ones uh, in the future, uh, we could see this as a, a, a good uh, adversarial study tools to see um, how effective um, the physio-based forgery detection could be and how easy to circumvent those. Um, so we did exactly that. Let me um, replay this. Uh, um, so this is uh, uh, my uh, former student and collaborator, Ming Liang Chen. And uh, we have his original video. You can see he has uh, really interesting cases. Uh, and uh, you would know what will be um, the heart rate at this point. If we do not want to review it, uh, um, we actually impose uh, very, very subtle um, perturbations on the video and could actually remove that heart trace. And certainly for um, as a, a tool to um, to against the uh, deep fake based uh, uh, detections, we could also specify what will be the heart rate uh, and trace over time we want the video uh, uh, to be and restore, for example, a valid heart trace. And that is what this uh, video is showing. And you can see that visually the changes was very, very small. So in other words, we have made the changes that preserved the video uh, fidelity, but while removing the heart trace, or in this case, uh, editing the physio traces. So here um, is the, the block diagram illustrating the process uh, where we um, first extract the uh, RPPG signal. And in this case, it's uh, somewhat different uh, uh, from, the, um, um, from the earlier monitoring. The monitoring is more an analysis process. We do not have to worry about uh, uh, generating another video, we analyze video and produce uh, um, the uh, the heart rate uh, or the RPPG uh, signals. But uh, for this uh, pulse editing, uh, we also need to have a synthesized step. Ultimately, we want to generate the video. So in this, uh, we try to um, analyze multiple regions of interest after analyzing the facial features. And for each region, we try to deduce uh, what are the um, the, um, the skin intensities over time for each region. Um, and then there can be some of the um, uh, differences between different regions uh, due to the lighting and the shadowing conditions. And we try to compensate those uh, after analyzing each of the local regions, we could um, subtract that uh, mild trend. Um, and then uh, after the trended signals, uh, they share in their common traces uh, would be the heartbeat. Uh, so we were looking at the heartbeat uh, in each of these regions that consistently. And now this is where we would do the manipulation. Um, in the cases, as I illustrated here, uh, we want to target a, a, a new um, heart rate trace. Um, we would feed the tar targeted heart rate signals here and compare how much they deviate and then try to distribute the changes to different regions, forming the perturbation signals to each of the area. For our uh, IFS communities uh, familiar with, uh, for example, digital watermarking um, and, uh, and other type of uh, um, um, anti-forensic techniques, you could imagine that this would be something that as our, our deduced perturbation or kind of a specific um, uh, counter um, uh, watermark that we would then um, uh, uh, propagate back to the pixel level of each of the region of interest. And then we will merge and uh, form, uh, putting back to the um, um, original video frame. And that is what you saw the edited version. So you can see we can um, do this very effectively. Now, certainly this is a proof of concept. As a successful uh, uh, forgery detection, uh, we would already demonstrate that we are able to 
um, mitigate the detection uh, from the recent work um, that was um, um, using this uh, RPG to trace as the main uh, modality to detect forgery. Now, when we add more perturbations, there are more changes made on the video. So you can think about uh, in this cat mouse game as a forensic analyst, then we should also count on our other forensic tools to look at, is there any um, uh, additional noise and perturbations that's not natural to the, um, to the normal um, uh, straightforward um, uh, video capturing imaging process? And uh, if so, we would uh, uh, detect not the, in terms of the heart trace, but actually in terms of the additional editing made on the video. Now, on the flip side, from a forger point of view, they could also use those tools as a, a additional uh, regularizer or additional constraints when they design this kind of perturbation to make it more natural and harder to detect. So we are really looking forward to see more of the study on this, but all in all, from the good guy point of view, from a really mitigated forgery point of view, the overall goal is to really try to uh, identify various uh, um, uh, traces or various aspects to collectively build uh, a set of tools to make it much harder for the forger to, um, uh, to make changes at their will and collectively to block their degree of freedom for making changes. Now, speaking also about uh, privacy protection, in addition to kind of removing the site like, for some of the application, what we have found uh, as we uh, move from the uh, more traditional security forensic area and entering this uh, health uh, and uh, uh, medical physio uh, monitoring field, we have also learned um, to um, do various uh, IRB-based uh, human subject studies. And what we found that uh, uh, the, the amount of the data uh, and especially benchmark set um, in this area um, is uh, still quite limited. And this is actually um, in many of the uh, this uh, internal research review uh, board, uh, the, there's a really a, a set of ethic rules and, uh, and uh, best practices how we can protect the safety and the privacy um, and the security um, of the users participating in various human subject study. So in this area, um, in terms of providing the privacy, it's actually very tricky because not only the face will give you the person's visible identity and the research itself also enable us to know their uh, physio heartbeat, breathing patterns, their blood oxygen, their heart rate variability, many of the uh, health-oriented attributes. So the house also coupled with the person's identity, and that's really a double dose of the uh, sensitivity in terms of the, uh, the privacy. So this really motivates us to see how we could foster um, more data collection and data, especially data sharing um, uh, between organizations in the community while uh, mitigating some of those privacy and then identity protection concerns. Uh, so this motivates us to look at what if uh, we try to do some of the transform, try to uh, remove those uh, uh, more sensitive uh, identity uh, relating traces. Um, by doing, for example, different degree of details, or I mean, in this side, uh, you could still see the the, uh, the person's uh, uh, approximate uh, uh, facial features and the layout, and uh, that motivate us while doing one more round um, by um, transforming or aligning those uh, specific facial feature layout into a standard avatar. So doing this facial landmark normalization, but while still preserving the facial skin area um, and to enable the comparison and enable the, uh, the testing of uh, various uh, video um, monitoring works from video. Uh, so we have, this is a really uh, ongoing work and we are uh, um, uh, carrying out uh, some of the user surveys. So we invite uh, interested attendees uh, to scan the QR code and to visit our survey site. Your identity is 
is not uh, um, uh, really uh, reported, and we just want your opinion to let us know what level of privacy protection you considered as sufficient or equivalent. Uh, so moving forward, um, um, uh, we are uh, going to um, echo back to um, say a few more words about uh, um, uh, various type of uh, um, uh, physio modalities. Once we have the uh, uh, RPBG signals, uh, one of the very interesting and important uh, attributes in a physiological study is known as heart rate variability or HRV. Uh, if you um, uh, wear any of the wearable devices uh, um, and monitor the, uh, the health conditions, you may have seen this heart rate variabilities. Uh, it's basically just as the name, it's the variation in time between adjacent heartbeat. Um, so uh, contrary to some of our intuitions, each of the heartbeats, the, the time duration is not uniform. And they actually have some of the mild differences. And this is actually controlled by uh, the so-called ANS, uh, autonomic nerve system. This is a primitive kind of an unconscious part of our nerve system that we cannot really consciously control, but they really very important um, to make sure our digestive system work well, our heart pump blood to every our body, and we breathe uh, and to uh, provide a nutrient to everywhere of our body as needed. Um, so uh, during this uh, um, kind of part of this nervous system, uh, between the beat, there will be subtle differences. Uh, and depending on our, our, our conditions, uh, um, sometimes our heart rate uh, variability will be uh, increased or decreased uh, depending on the need of the body. And overall, as uh, an average, uh, especially in the resting cases, heart rate variability is an important indicator to a person's stress levels. Um, um, and when we are under stress or really uh, face danger, our body really need to uh, get different parts to work together to really uh, tackle those challenges. And vice versa, we will be more relaxed um, and as we recover. Um, so this is an important indicator. And you could also imagine that we could use such information in the next generation of deep fake detection to utilize not only the heart rate uh, or not only the heart trace presence, but also utilize some of the heart rate variabilities to see whether it's consistent with the movement, with the activity the person is uh, engaging in. And then therefore to look at whether there's any mismatch or anomaly. But first of all, we need to be able to extract this from video. And this is actually also uh, uh, for many, um, uh, some of the preliminary work in the published in the, in, um, in the literature, but overall, um, this is a more challenging compared with the wearable. The wearable is a touch-based sensor. The PPG signal is much high quality and it can get this uh, HRV more accurately. But the, from the remote imaging modalities, uh, the noisy PPG would mean that uh, uh, the waveform may have various motion artifacts and the, uh, in between, uh, we might miss a bit and that actually could uh, introduce a substantial differences between the uh, the peaks. Uh, this is known as the uh, interbeat uh, intervals. So that's uh, the, known as IBI. And in fact, the HRV, the heart rate variability, is basically a function derived from the interbeat uh, interval signals. And there are a few uh, common metrics uh, that I will um, just uh, summarize here. And they basically are measuring how much uh, uh, differences between the uh, the time durations of uh, adjacent beats and are uh, commonly used the root mean square uh, of the successive differences uh, just focusing on the adjacent beats differences and then um, sum up the, uh, uh, the, 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 the squared um, differences and then taking a square root. Um, and then uh, if we are looking at how much deviation away from the average, um, uh, we would have this uh, known as a standard deviation of uh, all the IBI of a time window of interest. And we are also interested in, is there any particular uh, IBI intervals that's particularly longer? 
uh, than, for example, a, a common threshold of 50 milliseconds. Um, so those are common um, attributes to analyze from a uh, health and physio monitoring side. And we also envision those could potentially be useful uh, for various forgery and integrity uh, purposes in the future uh, when the uh, RPVG can be reliably uh, detected. Now, um, in addition to the heart rate variability, we have touched on the ECG and mentioned about the this uh, uh, electric, uh, this more gold standard for in the medicine, in the cardiology uh, field um, to uh, measure the, uh, the electric potentials that govern the uh, muscle contractions of our heart functions. And when we work on this uh, uh, imaging based or remote uh, uh, PPG work, uh, uh, I have a very interesting discussion with a program manager uh, in National Institute of Health. Um, so he found that our, our research and also the research in the literature uh, for measuring the heart uh, rate is very interesting. But he said that, well, in, the, in sports and fitness, the heart rate might be sufficient, but to um, the greater interest in the medicine, uh, their gold standard is the ECG. So he challenged us, can we actually from the video be able to deduce ECG signal? So my first time hearing his uh, uh, question, I was uh, uh, really intrigued, but also feel that it's nearly impossible because you already have seen how much of the heavy lifting we need uh, in order to deduce the uh, the heart rate from PPG, but ECG is much thought, I mean, it, ECG, uh, the, the waveform shapes uh, um, is more unique. And uh, we may not be able to really sense that kind of uh, sharp signal. Uh, but the more I thought about it, I was very intrigued uh, and really want to see, is there a way we could uh, uh, tackle this problem? So actually one of the enabling steps during our pursuit of this uh, um, interesting and intriguing question is to see, is there a relation between the ECG and PPG? Uh, because if we can do, we actually could uh, contribute to the medicine um, um, and also can shine more light uh, from a, a general forensic point of view. Um, the ECG is, uh, as I mentioned, is an electric potential. PPG has a very different uh, sensing modality. Um, but if we could do this, then uh, many of the clinical knowledge is on ECG, but ECG measurement is uh, more involved. Um, you need to deal with those speakers. Um, and you may ask, well, the Apple Watch has this, uh, uh, this ECG uh, in their new models, but those first would require you as a user to be actively involved and put your finger there for 30 seconds. Uh, and, um, and usually if for longer term monitoring, are you going to hold off uh, uh, your crumb of the watch uh, forever, um, for an hour for a longer term monitoring um, in order to catch some of the more rare events. Um, so, uh, but PPG is a more friendly, we could wear something that, uh, um, that we can um, almost forget about it. Um, so it would then uh, help us to um, have more user friendly um, measurement and then to infer important information that will provide um, um, more useful information and transfer some of the knowledge from the um, ECG-based diagnosis and then to foster um, the PPG-based diagnosis. So with that thinking, we actually um, embark on a journey to look at what are the relations between PPG and ECG. If you found a pure data science or machine learning black box uh, um, uh, angle, so you could say, I just uh, gather a bunch of uh, ECG and PPG pair, and I try to fit uh, a neural network or fit a model in. But we want to really, um, from a, a signal processing perspective, we want to see if we can get a more explainable model because the doctor uh, for the medicine explainability is very important. Um, so here, what we have uh, seen using our signal processing, signal system uh, modeling uh, background, we looking at this uh, very signature ECG uh, waveform, we see there was a sharp QRX uh, uh, complex, and then the, the PPG are much smoothened. 
how are they related? So they too, superficially, the uh, uh, sensing mechanisms are very different. Um, so if you talk uh, to uh, a medical doctor or uh, a bio uh, engineering uh, researchers, uh, they will say, well, this doesn't make sense to do the inference. But from a signal system point of view, when our when the potential triggered our muscle function, so that's the source uh, that's closer to the source of the actions. And then as the uh, potential and then um, the muscle contractions or relaxations, they push the blood as a, a liquid um, median um, through different parts of our body. And eventually we got the sense that using optical means to uh, add our finger or different part of our body. So you can see they are really related uh, from this uh, signal and system point of view as a source, maybe going through um, our body as a complex system. If we simplify this, it may be a, a, a kind of approximate as a filter to uh, capture this as a sharp waveform, but being smoothened as they pass through um, different part of bodies through this blood as a liquid medium to the end and then sends through the optical means. So there's various uh, very natural smoothing operations that we can understand. But they have this source and uh, input and output behavior very naturally uh, that we would think of maybe a kind of filter, but it could be very complex, may not be simple LTI filter. But as a simplicity, could we approximate it using maybe a linear operation? And then we can gradually add some of the high variance and some of the linearity to help us gain more insights and relate the, um, this behavior from the um, more source uh, um, input signal of ECG and what will be the um, resulting output uh, as the PPG signal. So in this journey, um, our uh, first uh, kind of uh, um, conceptual uh, thinking the high level methodologies uh, with this uh, biophysical and the imaging mechanisms uh, is uh, um, well, the lower part, if this is uh, really a smoothening operations, uh, um, naturally we would think about an invert or inverse filter or pseudo inverse filters. The, for whatever spectrums uh, we got suppressed, uh, we would try to amplify it out. And what, whatever we got uh, boosted, we would try to suppress it back. That is what the basic inverse filtering uh, methodology. But for the spectrum that has already completely removed, the traditional inverse filtering would tell us, well, we do not do the, uh, the impossible and those that would otherwise amplify the noise. However, we also notice that our ECG signal is not any arbitrary signal. They have this signature waveform, which means that there's a, a tremendous amount of structure or relations in the signal samples in the time domain, as well as in the spectrum domain. Um, so this actually motivates us uh, and also borrowing the techniques uh, and the uh, conceptual thinking from other parts of signal processing. For example, uh, um, in, in terms of the bandwidth extensions from the speech and the audio communities, uh, uh, when our signal is uh, highly structured, be it a speech signal, having this AR process modeling, or the ECG signature waveforms. That means their different spectrums could also have a good amount of relationship or dependencies. And if we can learn uh, this uh, relation, then we can um, use the recovered, for example, low spectrum, low frequency spectrum to recover and infer the uh, higher spectrum part that was seemingly lost from the PPG part of the corresponding spectrum. So that is so our uh, high level methodology, try to see how we can do this inference, um, both in this conceptual two step, we actually can do one step, we could use this part of the spectrum to see how we can infer the uh, spectrums both in the lower, middle and higher part. And what we started out is from uh, approximate to filtering uh, 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 models as the simp simplicity, and then we gradually really learn um, and adding in data to see if uh, the relationship is beyond a simple filter, how can we refine and enrich our representation? So that is a basic concept. We have the training phase 
to learn the signal properties, how we represent ECG, how we represent the PPG, uh, and then also what are their corresponding relations. Then uh, when we in the testing or utilization phase, we only have the PPG measurement from more friendly, for example, wearables or imaging modalities, and then use our learned model to infer the corresponding ECG. So we have uh, um, published several papers in this area um, and through this uh, very um, kind of explainable and structured uh, um, investigation, we started out with a DCT-based basis that has uh, our signal processing community has uh, um, really a good understanding to model the um, highly correlated data. And then we see that we can capture um, the overall waveform, um, but uh, with some of the um, uh, for example, disease patients, uh, the representation may not be rich enough. And then we move on to refine that uh, using dictionary learning um, to learn better atoms to and, and a richer dictionary to learn different kind of uh, um, ECG uh, relation as well as their uh, relationship with the PPG. And our ongoing work uh, uh, will guide us using such models so that what we produce would be more experimental and meaningful and uh, using on the selective part to use a deep uh, network uh, and incorporate more data when they are available to help us uh, enrich our representation. Um, so you can see that with uh, dictionary learning, we will be able to um, um, uh, infer the um, ECG with a different uh, uh, disease conditions. So more details that uh, you can see um, several of our conference paper published in the um, um, biomedical and health informatic conference of the IEEE as well as ICAS, and uh, a recent paper published uh, uh, is uh, um, actually imprinted uh, to the IoT journal. Um, okay, so so far we have focused our attention uh, mostly to the uh, optical based sensing. As promised, so we are going to uh, uh, change gear uh, using the next 10 minutes or so to look at the uh, radio frequency based sensing. And that's a really a fast emerging areas um, of uh, utilizing the radio frequency signal, especially the uh, when the Wi-Fi uh, signals are becoming ubiquitous to our modern world. Um, and as the environment change, the uh, changes of our movement, we open the doors um, and uh, we walk through uh, um, in a, a building as well as the subtle movement of our breathing um, could actually perturb the overall um, EM field surrounding us. And that could introduce the big and small changes um, when the um, uh, RF transceivers are send, sending and receiving signals. Um, so a, a community um, in the uh, communication, sensing, mobile computing uh, have been looking at these areas to see how we can use the wireless sensing uh, to enable many of the home security, uh, smart home automations, uh, uh, and to um, uh, enable smart buildings, uh, and also in the health and the physical monitoring to help uh, monitoring uh, health. And one of the advantages uh, um, in the RF is it's not visible. So the um, one of the um, uh, compelling advantage is it potentially have uh, a better kind of a privacy protections compared with uh, the um, imaging based approaches using um, normal visual uh, camera. So here, if we look at what the uh, um, RF based sensing work are harnessing, um, the, usually there is a, a transmitter and a receiver and often um, those that could uh, be coming uh, doing both kind of work, so as the transceiver. And as they send the um, uh, these modulated uh, RF signals, uh, modulating at a uh, um, certain frequency range, um, um, following many of the um, studies in the wireless communications um, and, uh, and the radar communities, uh, there's supposed to be a direct path, which is usually uh, called our uh, LOS, line of sight, but they are also bounce back uh, different objects as well as the persons. So those are known as the multi-passing effect. 
from a traditional um, communication point of view, the direct line of sight gives you the direct and the high quality signals, and those multipaths will create multiple kind of shadows or echoes uh, that's uh, really bad, and people try to remove or mitigate those. Um, but then um, researchers in communication have found, well, if we know how to harness those multipaths, we actually could see multiple versions of the signals so that we could actually prove provide more reliabilities, and if we can combine them properly together, we can boost, uh, um, we can beef up the uh, the throughput as well. And wireless sensing uh, um, uh, utilizes uh, multipath in a similar way, but instead of uh, transmitting uh, data at a certain bandwidth, they try to utilize, um, are there any things change uh, at different moment? Um, in different multipaths, and then what can I make sense of those changes in the multipath profile that the transceivers would uh, um, would rep uh, would uh, would obtain? So therefore, this really interprets those multipath disruptions for sensing purposes. As I mentioned, the profound advantages is no camera and no wearables and no sensors. But it's also inherently quite challenging because the signal is uh, really combined and buried uh, within each other. So that's where this community um, of wireless sensing that uh, uh, myself and Chao have also involved um, in some of the work uh, uh, with our colleague at University of Maryland and uh, the uh, one of the high tech startup that we have. Uh, um, um, uh, done some of the collaboration and consulting. The Origin Wireless, uh, funded by my, by my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Ray Leo at UC Maryland. Um, so they, um, the, the research team had actually um, uh, made a lot of progress in this area. Um, in one of the uh, significant progress is to really harness this uh, uh, set of information known as CSI. This is not a crime scene investigation. It's standing in this context for uh, channel state information. And what this does is basically try to obtain this uh, multipath um, um, uh, profile in terms of the channel impulse response. As we see in this simplified uh, um, uh, illustration, there's a direct path, a line of sight, and that has some delay. So if I send a pulse uh, here, just, uh, just a, a straight pulse there, I will receive it at a delayed point. But there are also other passes and that will take longer. For example, this is the gray and red ones, and you will see them at a different uh, uh, a delay. Um, so this is really captured here um, as the impulse response the modeling this uh, uh, assistance that we see. Uh, each of the paths, uh, um, depending on the penetration uh, attenuations, they may have a different uh, channel gain. And if modulation is involved in the um, common modeling in the radar and uh, wireless communication is to bring this uh, to a baseband uh, uh, equivalence. So some of these channel gains uh, could uh, be represented using a complex number. And there's also delay. Now, depending on whether the person or the overall environment is changing or not, if it's walking or door is opening or I have subtle breathing, you could see that this delay profile over time could be changing and the uh, channel gain could also be changing. That's why we put this T here, and then we use this tau to represent this uh, uh, general impulse uh, uh, response uh, uh, variables. And um, in addition to this time domain representation, we can take a, a Fourier transform um, to get this frequency response. So overall, um, in the mobile computing community, when this uh, was first uh, uh, being investigated, many, many of the work use the so-called RSSI. This is basically uh, a receive the signal strength. Um, you, you can think of this as an aggregated uh, kind of property, how strong the signal is, uh, whether it's uh, being attenuated, but it's really everything along together. It may not really provide the detail. If we are able to really looking into among the various subcarriers uh, of how this uh, different uh, uh, um, uh, in terms of gain and delay profiles, uh, then we will be able to uh, provide more insights and see different subcarriers that maybe um, also are capturing uh, different multipaths in different ways. 
so that we could uh, really kind of, uh, it's a joint analogy to a prison. Um, the sunlight, uh, instead of aggregate effect, we basically try to decompose and then um, identify more details and doing uh, providing more clues to do this analysis. Um, but analyzing those multipaths, especially beyond the first few dominant passes, uh, are challenging uh, in general. Um, and uh, if we take this uh, regular reflection models, uh, we need to really know all the geometry um, and the layout. And that is really tedious and almost impossible in general. Um, what the um, uh, origin and Junior Maryland team has uh, really made a breakthrough is to look at those reflections uh, uh, could actually introduce, uh, uh, if you think about uh, when we look at this visible light, we will be uh, thinking about, well, there's an equivalent image there. And then all those uh, um, uh, reflection points could serve as uh, uh, kind of a virtual antennas. And they are uh, passing or relaying the signals. So using such uh, uh, methodologies, they are actually modeling various scatters, whether it's a uh, static ones such as the object of furniture or dynamic ones such as walking uh, persons um, to uh, model those uh, scatters and consider them as virtual antennas. And each of them would have give you different uh, uh, multipath uh, influences. And then they're looking at the overall uh, statistical properties of the EM wave and derive a beautiful analytical results. So for example, when you have a movement, they can model it using the basal functions. And some of the parameters of that basal functions would reflect the degree of speed or um, the degree of movement. So if we put together that, uh, we could actually use to um, monitor sleep. Actually, the sleep monitoring, there are two major things, the breathing pattern, and the motion. But traditionally, you would act, actually hook up a lot of wearables to uh, monitor the brain activity, muscle activity, cardio conditions, uh, and so on. It's not only expensive, uh, it's also very invasive. Um, some of the alternatives will be using pressure mat. It's not so uh, accurate, uh, just um, measuring the, the movement. And uh, other using radar, uh, such as ultra uh, wideband UWB that requires short range. And the wearables uh, uh, is not always accurate, especially with the motion artifacts. Um, so the RF provides uh, uh, a major alternative. Um, so in the intro time, I will not go into very details, but breathing is a periodical. So they, um, the researchers uh, um, at uh, Origin working on this have found that the breathing signals, if we analyze the, this uh, um, um, autocorrelations of breathing, they actually can relate to the autocorrelation of this CSI. When they visualize, you can see different subcarriers over time. Uh, some of them will give you more patterns of these repeating that representing breathing better than others. Uh, so that naturally will bring on uh, uh, how can we really strategically combining different channels, and that's the maximum ratio combining. Um, the methodology has been used in the wireless communication and also in um, other forensic work like you know, the power signature EMF work, we have also used this concept um, to combine different harmonics. And here is used uh, um, to help us merge into a more enhanced breathing signal. Um, so after that, so we can uh, really model whether there's a significant movement. Um, and if when their movement is not dominant, uh, then the breathing will be able to be detectable. And we can see from the first peak of the side lobe of the uh, autocorrelation, we'll be able to uh, infer what is the breathing rate at that time. And, and then combining the motion statistics and the breathing, we will be able to classify sleep versus wake and also uh, by different breathing rates and variations, uh, um, the researchers can further um, doing some staging because uh, different uh, stages of the sleep, uh, uh, our physiological um, uh, conditions are exhibited differently. So they have uh, um, run some of the studies compared with uh, other like UWB based approaches and were able to uh, classify the, uh, the, the sleep stages in higher accuracy. And they have a, a, a reference as a gold standard in sleep monitoring. This is the lead researcher from Zhang. You can see he was hooked up with all the wearables. And the first time he 
uh, try it, it's very hard to sleep. Uh, while using RF sensing, you don't have to wear anything, so it's more user friendly. Um, and uh, in the breathing, uh, uh, as I would just quickly um, 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 looping back to the PPG, PPG can also uh, monitor breathing, but with a different mechanism. The RF basically sense this very subtle movement. And the PPG is looking at the cardiovascular activity. Our breathing can induce different variations as a slowly changing things. And we can analyze the PPG. Uh, my student and I had uh, do, uh, and the collaborators at the FDA have derived uh, some of the amplitude and frequency modulation models and published it in the HV Journal of uh, uh, Biomedical and Health Informatics. So basically utilizing that and then looking at whether there's any uh, plus and minus delta F around the heart rate to help us infer the breathing. Uh, so I will um, uh, wrap up. So uh, in summary, we have uh, um, given a, a, a tutorial style overview on um, uh, various type of physiological signals. They are generally micro signals. Uh, um, and you can see um, the applications uh, and the uh, rising from uh, both the health applications to potential law enforcement and also the uh, media and uh, forgery detections. We see cross-cutting synergies uh, among multiple technical areas. Uh, there's both a benefit that we can monitor a uh, physio from uh, without contact and uh, at times uh, even without active user involvement, but that also have privacy implications such as in pro sports I mentioned or in surveillance, uh, um, the, uh, the privacy issues uh, of the health conditions of the person could be um, need to be considered. Um, looking ahead, uh, we see uh, promising use uh, in telehealth, early screening of uh, disease or pandemic, um, and uh, facilitate law enforcement uh, um, in uh, various investigations, and also have a role in um, uh, media forgery detections or counter detections. And in the technical community, uh, we really see um, the, the approaches are more principled uh, versus data driven. And what we see um, in the future is really how we can uh, harmonize these two methodologies, really utilize more insights, explainable, but also utilize the data to help us tackle challenging situations. And we want to acknowledge uh, the funding support from National Science Foundation and University of Maryland, as well as our state of Maryland through various funds. Um, and uh, a number of our collaborators in the uh, health uh, and physio and medical areas, um, as well as our graduate student and also some of the uh, undergraduate researchers are also listed here. So I will stop here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure for Chao and I to present the tutorial. We'll be happy to address questions both here and offline. Thank you very much. Min Chao Wai, thank you. Thank you really a lot for this great presentation. It was really uh, enlightening uh, what uh, you have explained and these micro signals that can be applied in so large variety of applications. Okay, so are there any questions in the audience? Okay. I can start to make a question if, uh, okay, William. I don't know. In boy, boy, boy. Have you a question? William, there is a very strong echo from the room. Okay. Okay, I can start with a question, uh, me and Chaiva. So uh, what I wanted to ask is uh, you, you have shown that uh, um, you have uh, both considered signal processing approaches and deep learning ones. And I wanted to ask you your opinion. Uh, I mean, what do you think are the weaknesses and strengths of both? And um, do you think, that, okay, you, you already said at the end that maybe one can try to make a sort of synergy or try to combine them. But I uh, just want to have some more uh, details about what you think can be like the, a way to 
combine both this type of different directions and uh, uh, in your experience, uh, what you think is, uh, are the most important, uh, uh, I mean, what is most important for, from a signal processing perspective and a deep learning perspective? Okay, so um, deep learning um, provides us a really utilization of the data. When the data is abundant, uh, we do see uh, there's a profound uh, um, um, advantages uh, that, uh, for example, computer vision community has demonstrated. Um, but I also want to caution, many of the results uh, show good results on data set. And many of those data sets are still quite ideal. And in a real world, uh, just uh, by the lighting changes, um, it could actually um, provide uh, uh, quite a different signal statistics uh, so their distribution really shifts. Um, and then those may not be um, uh, captured, especially by end-to-end uh, -end, uh, approaches. So what we have seen, we have also done uh, various comparisons and really try to gain understandings. What we have seen is uh, um, if the, um, the mechanisms can, so there's actually quite uh, um, uh, competitive and similar uh, performances from uh, principled approaches such as uh, the, the work like PASS uh, um, that Chao Wei had uh, uh, reviewed um, that has a very competitive uh, uh, result um, and uh, in many cases it can also adapt quite uh, a bit better than the um, neural network approaches. The more complex neural network does not uh, directly translate to uh, more um, uh, better results, especially when we test on brand new and the more real world uh, data set that the, um, the, the, the inventors of the particular neural network uh, models hasn't really tested or aware of. Um, and I, I think in, when we use in medical domain, as well as in the future, if any of this would go in into the court, um, throwing a black box when the model yeah. is not very well explainable yeah. Can be a right. Concern. I mean, I, I also agree that the explainability uh, aspect is, is, is really important. And the fact that you can detect such a physiological signal, I mean, you can explain what you're doing. Uh, and so you can actually uh, justify, I mean, your result, which is something that you cannot uh, really can do well, <laughs> at least uh, in a deep learning uh, strategy. So I think this is great. Uh, I mean, uh, also the fact that you're working on such weak signal. So I also work, work a lot on, on weak signals. And so I'm very sensitive to this. What the, in your applications, which are the reasons for which, uh, I mean, of course there, can, there could be noise or whatever for which these traces become very weak, but what are the major uh, causes for which you, you say, okay, in this, in this case, in this application, it's really hard to detect the, the trace. So actually, um, it, it, since our root uh, for both Chawi and I has been the forensics, uh, um, we actually, as you know, we have worked on different micro signal. Um, the, the, this is, was actually the angle um, that we enter this the physiological or health monitoring. By looking at uh, the, um, the uh, examples given primarily are the resting cases. So we almost always are looking at what are the challenges. So the challenges could be I mean, when you're running on the track. You know. So that's actually when uh, Chao Wei and I and our other um, former students and collaborators started out. If you're running on the track, you know, the movement will be dominant. And at that time, we were working on uh, ENF, the power signatures. So we were work looking at a similar um, motion compensation and uh, uh, subtracting the underlying uh, content. So that's the, the angle that we look at. Um, so indeed, it, when there are not resting cases, you will see the dominant changes coming from movement, coming from the same content. That's not so straightforward to subtract. Um, and then resulting that very small signal. And once we compensate, so that's the kind of residual analysis um, uh, methodology that Chao Wei mentioned. Um, and then we also see uh, we need to trace that uh, thing traces. And that traces is almost as noisy as uh, um, the ENF signals that we have seen, and at times even uh, even stronger interference and residuals from other sources. 
So this is really the, so we, we didn't really tackle this uh, um, like uh, many other from biomedical field do actually, but we really looking at how our expertise in the forensic community can help uh, contribute um, and uh, add values to that community. So you can see um, the signal is actually very small. You, you can hardly tell. And then depending on the lighting and also depending on facial colors for the heart rate tracking, if the skin color is dark, the signal from that ratio is lower. And if the, the lighting play a role, um, actually, it's counterintuitive, it's not the brighter is better. If it's a saturate, it's actually the signal cross ratio effectively is not very high. You need the right amount of lighting if that's under our control to provide a good signal cross ratio. Thank you, Min. Thank you very much. I think we have a William. question in the room from uh, Christian Reis. Hi, Min. <laughs> We cannot hear. I think they have echo. Maybe when they are asking They're questions. Probably multiple. Okay, maybe you can hear me now. Hi, yes. <laughs> this is Christian. Um, so you showed these nice results to predict an ECG signal from a PPG signal, and from the curves that you've showed, it also looked as if, of course, there's like a medical artifact in the PPG signals that sort of correlates with what you'd expect to see in the ECG signal. And now from a medical point of view, I'm wondering, um, wouldn't it be preferable maybe or remove like one possible source of error if you you directly train medical doctors to to interpret the PPG signals instead of doing this additional translation step, right on that slide, yeah. Indeed, yes, yes. So this is a slide that we talk about the uh, one of the representative results. Um. Uh, so indeed, uh, one of our goal is uh, in the future if we can um, uh, provide the medical doctor more insights doing the diagnosis and uh, um, readings directly from the PPG. And today, PPG-based um, diagnosis in the medical field are still uh, um, kind of emerging. And um, the mainstream, the currently trained doctors, um, are most of them are not really um, um, have a much, much insight directly on the PPG. So that was one of our motivation. And this is actually a project now uh, being funded through the NSF uh, Smart Health uh, uh, program is to how we can bridge this uh, medical uh, knowledge base. More, most of the knowledge is today is on ECG. Um, and it's, it's not as easy to kind of teach doctor directly. So we want to first use this as a an intermediate step, but eventually, if we can accumulate enough knowledge um, as well as data, we will be able to facilitate the interpretation directly from the PPG. Um, PPG is very subtle, and um, um, actually, we have seen uh, when the you can see these two patients, uh, they are. Um, their condition and their age are so different, but their PPG waveform seemingly are very similar. Um, but with the inference, uh, um, and we will be able to capture their those subtleties. Um, and we certainly here also have whether we have a, a precision medicine model so that we will be able to learn that person's uh, data, or um, in the situation we have these group models that based on their gender and age, we will train what will be the typical uh, ECG and PPG relations for this patient group. And then um, when we don't have the customized data, we will use that. But when we have the, the users maybe doing this uh, uh, 30 seconds of the ECG screening as in the US uh, for the annual physical, then we will be able to um, do this uh, um, transfer learning to customize the models and support more personalized medicine. So I think that's what you 
uh, talk about is really very good point. And that was actually one of our motivation as the entering process. And we hope we will be successful um, uh, when collaborating with med medical uh, experts in this area. Okay. Thank you. Maybe I have a question. No. Um, so I have a question. Um, what's about the, the quality of the images you process? Uh, is it uh, image um, directly from the sensor image roll or? Uh, TIFF image or after compression when you use a video, I um, assume that uh, the quality of the result depends of the image quality. So Charlie is actually an expert uh, in um, his uh, previous studies on video compressions and, and he also have uh, carried out some of the earlier results. You want to address the questions in terms of the effect of the uh, video quality. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so in general, compression will bring the compression noise in the usually incurred at the quantization stage. Um, so at the, so there are certain other modules will actually transform those quantization noise into other form of noise. So they are horrible to deal with, uh, but at the end of the day, they are kind of noise. And uh, uh, so in the most micro signal attraction tasks, uh, so our best friend is the the law of large number or central limit theorem. So the variance of the noise always go to zero once, once we have enough like samples or pixels when we average. So, so the key point is that uh, not to worry about what kind of noise it is, but trying to make certain transformations so that we will make the CLT, the central limit theorem perform well. So we do want to get a signal, very noisy signal, on my specific point on the face. I don't want to get a signal that sometimes on the face, sometimes in the background. So that will not incur the CLT correctly. So once we ensure that um, it's kind of, the noise is unbiased and then we, we can get more and more uh, uh, samples to, to, to get our signal out. Of course, there is a, for each specific application, we have a theoretical kind of frontier trade-off between the the noise and the, the, the utility or the performance of the algorithm. Yes, so we cannot get very low quality video in order to make, make this half rate or SPO2 estimation work. So we need to get reasonable quality. But at least for the iPhone camera capture the pictures, videos, and for some reasonable compressed videos, and these algorithms are still working. So it will be interesting for each of the specific scenario that we study the effect of compression. I agree that this is pretty, very important. And this, this compression noise, depending on the, what type of encoder it is using and, and are very different. But at the end of the day, I think that I want to reiterate that the most important thing is to get the, the processing done correctly so that we can apply the CLT in the correct way. And then of course, once we have done the pre-processing, we have done extraction, we need to do the extraction using some more fancy algorithm like the multiple trace tracking algorithm that we, 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 we talked just now. So all these modules are contributing to the success of the extraction, but not just one of them. I would say that um, if we only have the multiple trace extraction algorithm, but you do not really stabilize the phase, it will not give you uh, the heart rate. So, so that's, that's, that's the key. So we have multiple components on all of them need to work in reasonably well in order to present a nice system. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your comment. Uh, Louisa, we, we have um, another question at Montpellier. Okay, perfect, yes. Okay. 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 Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting to see uh, your approach to, to tackle this very specific problem with weak signals. And so as I understand, it's a very uh, noisy problem. So it's hard to, to find the, the real data. And I was particularly interested in the, 
in the measuring the saturated blood and you were saying that for example for a healthy person it was around 95 to 100 percent and for uh, someone affected with the COVID, it was more around 80. And so I wanted to, to know two things. Um, maybe I missed some results, but have you tried uh, actually uh, detecting uh, whether people were, uh, were infected with COVID? Maybe I missed some results. Um, and second of all, um, how long of a sequence uh, should you need to accurately me measure this um, uh, SpO2 fraction? Uh, Min, do you want to answer the first question? Uh, okay, so um, the for the SPO2, um, since we this we need to have a human subject uh, studies and uh, uh, RB approval, they are indeed in uh, with our uh, physiological collaborator. There's a protocol that could provide the um, healthy person a controlled amount of a low uh, uh, percentage of the oxygen and then induce this uh, so-called controlled uh, hypoxia, kind of a lower uh, blood oxygen count and to do the, um, um, to do the um, study. And that was in our plan, but because of the COVID, many of the human subject studies uh, um, were under serious, serious uh, restrictions to ensure the um, safety of the um, of the participant as well as uh, the um, um, the researchers. So those uh, um, we are not able to do um, during this COVID time. So we uh, opt for uh, alternative protocol, which is to, uh, to let the person breathe normally and uh, hold the breath um, for about 30 seconds and then uh, breathe normally and then repeating. So you can see that by this kind of a breath holding protocols, usually the, um, the amount of black oxygen cannot be lowered um, below about 90% for, for the people we involve in. If we would using that breathing, uh, we could go down to about 85 or sometimes uh, some of the protocols at conditions at 82%. So that is in our study, but you can see based on the data we are able to collect, we can follow the trend. Um, and uh, um, Charlie, you want to address the second part? Yeah, so the second question was about uh, how long the segment will be for prediction. Uh, so we, uh, so if I remember correctly, so we have tried uh, two seconds as a segment for one SPO2 value. So we may have overlap or we choose not to have overlap. So these are different experimental conditions, but overall, so, um, if you try your oximeter, so it, maybe after five seconds delay, you will display the, the, the result. So it means that it may have like so, so something at the order of one to 10 seconds, but we are using like two seconds or one second to estimate one point. So if, if we have a sampling rate issue, we will interpolate this reference SPO2 uh, and signal and then we, we try to match with the segmentation of the uh, of the input the video and then we do this point wise we, we do the pairwise supervised learning and that could give us uh, very interesting uh, good results yeah uh, thank, thank you Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, the the subjects that you were that you got your data from were they uh, static or were they in movement as well? In the heart rate case, uh, they are movement. Uh, um, but in the blood oxygen case, uh, when we study different uh, modalities, uh, we consider mostly uh, resting case. Okay, William, are there any other questions? No, mm, no? we have no more questions at Montpellier. Okay, I think that also in the chat, uh, there are no questions. I don't know if there are some uh, questions from remote uh, audience. If, if, if people want to make a question, you can just uh, chime in and make the question. I mean, no problem.
Okay. I think that uh, there are no more questions. So I want uh, again to really thank uh, Min and Chao Wai for this great presentation. I think it was really interesting to really interesting to see all these different type of applications and uh, the, all the work you have done in this area. So thank you again uh, for this presentation. And uh, William, I don't know if you have to, 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 to tell something for, uh, for the conference, for the workshop. I mean, maybe there is uh, some, okay. Okay. So thank you. Um, and now for today, it's finished. The open session. <laughs> I don't know if you hear the clap. <laughs> oh yes, maybe maybe if there yeah, are maybe. people, if there are people there, yes, it, it would be great. <laughs> we can <laughs> clap our hands to Miu and Chao okay. Wai Wong. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we heard it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Now we can uh, conclude and uh, close the session. Thank you, everyone. Nice to see everyone virtually. Um, and be safe. Enjoy the rest of the, the workshop. And I um, also thank you uh, very much for Louisa uh, mentioning about uh, my election. And I really appreciate many of our colleagues' support. And I look forward to work with our colleagues uh, for the societies uh, in the new capacity. Yes, I, I think it will be a very great, a great work, Min. <laughs> Starting next year, you will be very busy. <laughs> Congrats for this uh, result. Okay. Thank you. So in on one hour, we have um, the welcome reception. I'm sorry for, <laughs> for you. <laughs> but um, I hope to meet you next year on for the next uh, conference. Yes, let's hope to meet soon in person uh, without any type of restriction. Mm. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye to everybody. Thank you again. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.